Everybody and welcome to this, the first Finance Committee meeting for 2015. Uh, firstly, I'll call for apologies. I have an apology already for Councillor Young and uh, two apologies for members who wish to leave the meeting perhaps earlier than it will um, before it finishes. Councillor Mallet at 4 p.m. and Councillor Forsyth at 3 p.m. Looking around the table, I guess everyone else is here, so um, I will move that apologies be recorded. I'll have a second. seconder. Thank you, Councillor. Those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. Second item is to confirm the agenda, um, and I will so move confirmation of the agenda. I'll have second. a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Aye. Carried. Thank you. Um, declaration of interest. Are there any any members wish to make a declaration of any interest? No? Okay. Right, we have a public forum today, um, and uh, the public forum comprised two speakers, uh, Mr. John Gallagher and Mr. Um, uh, Boasen uh, uh, from uh, Bunnings. So I ask if uh, John would you like to speak first? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and councillors, for the opportunity to say a few words. And, and this is in reference to one of the items in the uh, confidential agenda, but it's to do with the Cochlear Drive, Gallagher Drive, Quinton Drive uh, intersection. And what I'm going to do is just quickly go over some of the history and a few points and then ask the council to assist to make it make what needs to happen down there happen. So, so brief history was the Gallagher's, we actually bought land down there about 1972-73 when Cockadier Drive was actually being developed about that time. So that's oh, over 40 years ago now, isn't it? Um, and then we opened or moved into our first factory down there in uh, the end of 1975, over into 76. And just looking at the numbers, the, the electronics factory was about 150 square metres. The, the engineering factory was about seven or 800 square metres and, and, and the silly office spaces. Uh, and uh, so in that, in that move, um, and then from there, uh, in 1977, we started to extend the electronics factory because it wasn't big enough, uh, the engineering factory. So over the number of years, we, we expanded our factories, and our initial purchase was only two and a half hectares down there. Then we bought another little bit, and then we got to the stage where the Waikato Times owned all the land around us, and so we come to a deal with them, and we purchased that off the Waikato Times. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the acreage was, but it seemed to be a lot, about 100 acres. But also what we did when we purchased all that land, we actually purchased that in the name of a charitable trust with a long-term view of, of funds, when it makes funds, going back into the community. And that's been quite successful as part of doing that. So I guess we're thinking long-term. Uh, and, and then as, as we went on, we got into the plastics industry by buying another company and then we located them on site about 84, I think it was. We bought a tool making company, we located them on site. Uh, and then, so when we get to 84, we actually, from the 40 star, about 45 staff when we moved onto the site, we were 275 staff. So in about an eight year period, we actually increased our staff. So that was putting, started put more traffic in then. And of course, with a large piece of land we purchased beside it, at, at some stage we then built the first part of Gallagher Drive, and then we of course paid for that, invested that in the council, and then we also then we extended that drive again in about 93, 94. So it actually went down to another industrial estate which we had purchased about ni uh, 1992. So we had really quite a large area of land there to, to work and develop, uh, and I guess. Over the time, just some of the key things, I think from the Tower Industrial Estate, we vested a big chunk of land down the bottom end there into a sort of a reserve. I think it's still got trees and all those sort of things on it. A walkway through from, uh, so there's now, I think you're developing a walkway from Collins Road right through to uh, Cotier Drive. We provided part of the land so you're able to do that. Uh, we also provided land uh, up the front of Gallagher Drive so for a roundabout, because that was the original idea of a lot of discussions that go back to council for years and years, was, was 
possible roundabout there. And we made some financial contributions to those, and I think that's noted in your paper later on today, so you know what numbers are there. Uh, just just a, a quick snapshot at about um, ten, in the last 10 years, we've done about six building expansions, plus numerous changes inside the buildings with change of use. And, and one of those in the early 80s, or the 80s to the 90s, was our two main businesses was electronics, <coughs> and that was growing like exponentially. But also engineering grew up until about 1984, and then good old Rogernomics killed it. Basically, removing all the farming subsidies, some of you will remember those. And, and just one instance alone of that, we were planning to build 380 forage harvesters. Now, each of these machines is about half a ton in weight and got a reasonable value. We sold 80 that year. Because basically, the subsidy had gone from the farmer. And so that was really the demise of the engineering business. By 1990, it was nothing. It was gone. What was the remaining bits we sold? And, and, of course, we had a lot of those buildings there, so over time, we'd repopulated them with part of the electronics. And I guess getting up to the later, later days now, the staff at the moment I, on that site is about 550 staff there. We have about 775 in New Zealand at the moment. So we have another plant up in Pukekohe and one in Martin, which uh, they were particularly specialist businesses that we'd, we'd purchased over time. But we also moved our the security business into into our site in the year 2000, and that, that's where then the new headquarters came from, the nice glass building we have down there, because that needed to accommodate quite a considerable number of people. And I guess it's over the years with the discussions we've had and the frustrations, we've been on the NZTA budget and then we get kicked off and then we didn't make the last one, and, and really frustrations of traffic, because I guess I drive in there often, and even this afternoon getting out, I had to do a bit of dodging car stuff to get through the cars. So, and I think any of you that have been down that part of the woods have noticed the frustrations that is at times of getting in and out. And of course now with the recent action of, of Bunnings and Z service station, looking to locate in that area and part of the city's view of help grow the city, um, that's really brought this back to head and Transit New Zealand has put an offer in place and uh, let's see if we can make it work. And my really plea is to, is to councillors uh, let's, let's help make it work this time. We've got an opportunity, and I guess it's one of the words of Ed Hillary you all know about Mount Everest, about knocking it off. Uh, let's, let's see if we can do it. Do it get that off. <laughs> Some of you might ask about the Western Bypass, and that's been on the books for about 40 years. And you remember that far back when Kaikiri Drive was developed? It was going to go off around the Chinaman's Hill. That was 40, about 40 years ago that turned up in the, in the books. It's still there. And, uh, and I think you've got nothing in your 10-year budget, 10 year budget, and uh, New Zealand Transport Agency have nothing in their 10-year budget. Will it make a difference to the traffic? Probably some of the traffic that's going right through, but I think 10 years plus is going to be difficult to wait for that. So my players, half the Gallagher's, the neighbours, etc., let's make it happen. And, oh, and one other little note was, I just was doing some work on all our properties down there. And we already pay you guys about a third of a million a year in rates, so maybe we can put some of that back in the road. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Thank you for your time. But any questions of John? <clears throat> Thank you very much, John, for, for coming in today. Okay. Next speaker, Mr. Borson. Borson, sorry. Sorry, it's uh, a tricky one. I'm used to it. Um, and uh, Mr. Borson is from Bunnings. Good afternoon, Mr Chairman, Councillors. Um, David Borson, I'm the Property and Store Development Manager for Bunnings. Um, really to talk to the agenda item that we have before you later on in Confidential this afternoon. The real key to the nub is we have an intersection. It's currently unsafe and has levels of service that are less than desirable in terms of the efficiency of the network. But I think we have to consider that in the context of Council's planning here. Council's actually had the foresight for its own economic development of the city to rezone land for business purposes. And it's reiterated those zonings through the last lot of proposed district plans. And it's actually taken that one step further now. And in terms of the district plan, it's actually recommending certain activities go in certain locations and promoting activities such as ours to locate on key arterial roads. Um, in terms of that, one of the matters that needs to go with that is to realise the economic growth from development occurring as it needs to have the infrastructure in place to facilitate the development to occur. Um, 
the project that we're talking about, it's bigger than just Bunnings, it's bigger than Gallagher's. There's a huge amount of business already down Kahikatea Drive, and there's actually 15 hectares of land sitting, effectively land banked or land locked, because there isn't actually appropriate traffic infrastructure to support it going through. We recognise that the project is a tricky one. This is at the nexus between two road controlling authorities, between Council and NZTA, but we see that there is a proposal on the table at the moment to solve the existing problem if we all get in and work there together to find a solution. That's us. Happy to take any questions. Thanks, David. Any questions? All right, thank you very thank you. much for, for coming in today. Thank you. All right, the um, public forum is now, is now at an end. Um, so we now move on to item five, and item five of the minutes of the meeting held on the 4th of December uh, 2014. Would somebody who was present at that meeting move those minutes as a true and correct record? Councillor uh, Turman. Councillor uh, Mallet seconded. <coughs> Sir, excuse me, right. I've just got a couple of questions out of them, if you don't mind. Yep. Um, so, key projects, page 9 of 90, uh, 2233. Second bullet point talks about the finance and IT implementation project. S second to last sentence, the project was scheduled to be completed by the end of December 2014. Has it been? I know there is a report of IT in here. get an IS sure update. Should we hold that question over? Yeah. Discussion then, or is somebody here from IS? Um, is it a question around the day? Question mark? Um, I'll, I'll introduce uh, Mark Donnelly. Mark is um, currently working for the IS team, but was also the project manager responsible for leading the dynamic implementation. Hi, Mark. Hi, Mr. Chim. The As reported in the last major project monitoring report, the project isn't completed yet. It's been held open pending resolution of issues with the uh, budgeting logic and AEX. So in the last major project monitoring report, we said that um, those issues were with Microsoft to be <coughs> resolved. Yep. Uh, since then, they have been resolved. Um, and we are now um, progressing into user testing with a view to rolling that solution out later in about, in about April. The main constraint now will be um, business resource to complete the testing. So, so the, the um, because the uh, minutes, no, no disrespect to anyone, the minutes are not particularly clear as to what the, pro um, you know, you have PIF numbers or something, so you can, it, it, it says the project was scheduled to be completed by the end of December 2014. You're saying it's, it's you're saying what you just said then, yep. and it's still not, there's still some work to be done, is there? That is correct, yes. Okay, is, it, is this bringing additional cost? Um, I believe that um, the CEO at the last meeting where the project was reviewed said that the um, costs were being uh, contained by the vendor. It's their responsibility to fix this issue, so no. And is it affecting our ability to serve people? Or? Um, uh, as discussed at the last meeting, this was the, the budget module was due to go live. It was never intended that the budget model module would be used fully for the 10-year plan process. Um, we had a system in place to ensure that the 10-year plan process was um, uh, and budgeting was completed. Um, we, were, we had hoped to do some testing of the budget model in parallel with the 10-year plan process to test it. We still intend to do that if we can have the budget fixes um, that have been provided by the vendor tested in time and released in April. We still intend to do some parallel running as a form of testing the system, but not as our primary mechanism for delivering the 10-year plan. So am I right saying that something that we thought was going to get done by the end of December, six weeks later, it's still not done, and we're, we're all comfortable with that and we've got it under yep. control? And yep, so the um, uh, hold up on the um, system itself was some fixes that were provided by the vendor at their cost and it took a little bit longer for those fixes to come through, and they were managed quite tightly with the vendor, and we've done everything we can to deliver that. The um, process now is to schedule the testing of those fixes and ensure that they are in place as soon as possible. So that's not an ideal scenario, I acknowledge that, um, but we've done our best to ensure that we've um, put appropriate level of pressure on the vendor to deliver their responses, 
now in the process of managing our staff to ensure that we get that testing completed as soon as possible. And do we have a date for that? Um, the go live is in April, my understanding, to have those testing completed and have the module up and running so we can actually use it in anger in terms of running the budget modules through it and so forth. Thank you. Could I suggest that, that this matter be added to the action list so that it remains uh, a current item? We've got another finance meeting in April. Absolutely. So if we can add it to the action list, then it, yep. it will automatically come forward then. Thanks, Rob. Okay. There was, sorry, there was one other matter, one other matter from the minutes, page 10, first bullet point, uh, about, it's about the community occupancy leases, projected income that the leases were to deliver as outlined in the policy, staff had not carried out an analysis regarding whether the renewed leases would provide the projected income outlined in the policy, but would carry out this work and circulate further information to members. Has that been done? Yes. It has been? Yeah, there okay. was a... Um memo sent out before Christmas, I, um, oh, okay. if I remember correctly. Um, there's also just I a, don't remember it, so obviously. <laughs> an, an item um, coming forward later on, which has a little snippet at the end around that, and this, uh, which basically gives the bigger picture how we're tracking against um, projected revenue and actual revenue, remembering that we're still going through the, the process of putting process of, of yep. some of those being renewed and going through the rental renewal. So. Uh, there was also a discussion yesterday at the Community Forum subcommittee just around a, a report which members are on that subcommittee just wanted to come back um, <coughs> at, at the next meeting of that subcommittee just around um, uh, probably some of the non-financial um, matters related to the implementation of the, um, the new policy. So, so that report will come back to that subcommittee too. So, so the, um, we're looking at having a really a, a one-stop template which will actually have that information in it so councillors can track that. So, so that item is covered in item 10, is it? We'll, we'll, yes. we'll get an update on that. Yeah, there's a, there's a little snippet 10. in there, um, but we're, we're, once we're um, through the latest tranche of um, uh, rental uh, changes, then we'll be in a better position to give council a, a full report on on how we're tracking, because at the moment we're still in the, the 1st of January was when that kicked into place, so we're just still in the process of um, working through that with the groups. Okay. Yes, yep. okay. okay, so any further discussion on the minutes? I have a mover and a seconder. Um, those in favour that the minutes represent a true and correct record, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. Okay, item number six is the action list. Um, and that, uh, just before we put the, that the report be received, um, just two, two matters I've identified there, item 15 and item 15. I think we've got two there with the same number. Um, is there an update? Have, have we got an update on uh, Whaifakariki in terms of the um, in terms of the uh, commissioners, um, the commission, uh, the hearing that was held in November, suggests here that uh, another hearing was held on the 10th of December. Is there some progress on? Yes, that information was uh, released yesterday, and the commissioner has um, uh, zoned the site a speci special nature zone, which provides for residential development. So does that come to the next S and P meeting, or, or where, where does it where does where does it? Uh, my understanding that's right. Um, Brian's team will be handling that. But um, there was a memo. I understand. I got one which went out to yeah. councillors last night from Luke O'Dwyer, which was yeah. emailed out. Okay. So so the commissioners have the full authority to make those decisions, and that decision was communicated to council via an email through from Luke yesterday. I didn't see that. So, a clarification. So that that's a planning issue, which presumably can be appealed. Yes. Yes. So it's it's subject to appeal. So it's subject to appeal. Yes. So that's actually about zoning. That's actually, in essence, got nothing to do with necessarily with councils. What council may or may not choose to do, in terms of the affected land. That's a separate decision process, obviously. That's correct. So, uh, with the resolutions which were passed uh, last. May when that was that issue was worked through by council, 
Um, a, we were waiting for the um, Commissioner's decision, and obviously appeals on that, and then B, um, the other thing was to, as we worked through the long-term plan and 30-year infrastructure plan was to be, get some certainty around when the, uh, the required infrastructure w which would allow the possible subdivision of that land to occur when that was being funded in the LTP. There's a bulk interceptor, I understand, um, that needed to go in and then some, um, some investment from developers as well between Wintech and um, the Road Carry Road area. So uh, there's two. two so there'll be a full report back on the whole matter coming so, back. So when, um, to um, on that. obviously, uh, the interested parties, what, what is their time um, limit for them to appeal this? Sorry, I can't answer that. I'm not a planner, so I don't have that. So obviously, that would be quite critical because it would be due process there. Yeah, I'll have to get back to you. I'll have to talk to Brian's team about um, what the statutory time frames are around. And it's, my, it's my understanding that council will be very proactive in advising all the interested parties of ensuring that all the interested parties have seen that decision. Well, they have been but, notified. Yeah, as no doubt. Anyway, yesterday. Been so. yeah. 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 Deputy Mayor Chesterman. Yes, thanks, uh, Chair. Look, it was just a question to Lance about the nature of the. Commission decision, it sounded a bit like a dollar each way. Uh, a decision for a special nature, but equally the ability to uh, allow residential, providing there was protection for the special nature. So I'm wondering if Lance could either confirm my understandings correct or clarify what I'm thinking uh, the Commissioner's decision meant. Mr Chairman, I'm probably not the right person. I'm, I'm not, planning's not my expertise. I can confirm it's a special natural zone which allows residential subdivision. My, my understanding is that that provides um, a certain amount of guidance on how the subdivision can occur and what needs to happen, e.g. in relation to um, built form and also the, the natural um, uh, aspects of the area. So, so it probably provides more protection than, than, say, a normal residential zone, so about lot size and um, what sort of plantings have to happen, still water mitigation and those sorts of things. We will Lance, just, 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 oh, sorry, yeah, Councillor Mallet. Lance, uh, Lance, presumably, uh, is this a, um, there's no other site like this in the plan? I, I don't know. I, I yeah, can't, you don't know? I, okay. It's not my area of expertise, I'm sorry. I can, can, I can, can I, request... I, um, uh, either to take these questions offline and respond to all of Council, or I can request that a member of the planning team does come down and respond to these questions. Might be in Luke's um, email, but I, didn't, I haven't seen that yet. Well, can I suggest that we have a separate briefing if yeah. people want to find I th out I think, more I, about yeah, I think that makes sense. Given that the decision came yesterday, there's obviously some work that needs to be done mm -hmm. and, a, and a, properly, uh, a properly framed up report so that we know what the pros and cons are of the decision and how it affects the various parties. Yep. Are you happy with that? To yeah, I, I, think, I think that, and, and obviously to the CEO, we're, we're looking for a very comprehensive report because one of the critical factors before Council makes a decision one way or t'other on whether that land is to be turned into a reserve or whether it's to be developed for, for you know, subdivisions obviously will be the conditions uh, around the, that subdivision. So I think I think the way ahead is, is appropriate and I would expect that briefing to be an open session so that media and any interested member of the public can attend. It's all there. I don't, I don't think there's any confidentiality about it. Right, thank you. Um, uh, the other item on, on the action list was item 15 also, which is the one in, re in regard to um, the... Um, <laughs> Um, land the, the reserve land purchases just to get an update that that is progressing and that we will have a full report on the 23rd of April. That's correct, <coughs> and there was some discussion on that in the 30 infrastructure plan briefing the other day, and there is a allocation in the long term plan for those um, small number of committed um, pieces of land that we're committed to buying under resource consent, but, um, but it was. The amount of money was um, uh, wasn't significant in 
the scheme of the LTP. But this process has been underway for some time, isn't it? Yes. Picking up so, on all so these bits of land. And you'll yep. receive a report yep. on all the detail around that, which pieces of they, land they are and those sorts of things. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Councillor King? Yeah, the report that's been requested for Waifakariki, um, who pays for that? What budget does it come from and can that be covered by internal costs or um, because Council have asked for a report like this, where, where does the money come from to write it? I tell you. Um, uh, Chief for you, Mr. Uh, Mr Chair, I suggest majority of the information that's been requested is readily, readily available um, through existing staff. And I think a, a good portion of it was uh, an information that has been sent out to Council mm -hmm. last night with the yes. information that was provided. I'd, we'll just review that, make sure it's clear, and then um, it'll potentially just be taking some questions from councillors in a, an appropriate format. Thank you. Okay, so any other items on the action list? Uh, I notice uh, the uh, S&P meeting has the six monthly reports from the subcommittees, and this is a new process as I understand it, where the subcommittees give a six monthly report. When does that happen for the, the F&M? For finance, for finance. Yeah, because yeah, you've got subcommittees. It's just a, I'm just working out the pro. It's just a process question because okay, I know well, S and P are doing that next week. Yep, yep. Typically, uh, this this committee uh, has reports from CCO and so forth. Yep. Um, generally, at the next meeting after their previous meeting. All right. So does that? So it apply? tends to tends to. So how many? It? I figured my. I apologise. I mean, I'm not sure how many committees report to you. Just remind me again, will you? Uh, business and investment. Yeah. Um, CCO. Yeah. And I think that's... Sorry, CCO, CCO, external funding and event sponsorship. So there's three. Yes. And just sorry, and I apologise if, if there's a flow, because I'm just... When do, so they report, they automatically report anyway? So um, I'm no. just... What I'm trying to figure out, we've got one process with one standing yes. committee, six monthly, yes. and I'm just trying to relate it to this committee, that's all. Um, my understanding through the Chair was that we will be having a six monthly report come at some stage. I'm not sure on the timing of that, but that can be confirmed later on. Okay, so at your next agenda setting, if, if you and the Deputy could just sync that up, I'd just suggest that we, we should have <laughs> a, a sort of a rough sync between the two standing committees. All right, through, through you, Mr Chair, the, the reason that it's not in the first six months of the of this year is also that we've got to give them time to actually start that reporting process for themselves as well. So um, we will look at the timing of that. Yeah, but the, like I'm saying, all the all the committees is one item which I've you know in the SNP, and I'm really looking forward to giving a very comprehensive. And I'll probably be tabling some extra documentation for the community forum committee. But that's sort of like happening next week. So obviously, it's just all I'm wanting to just seek is that I think it's a lot easier if we can just get a similar time span so that it would appear to me that if you're looking at a six monthly report roughly that the subcommittee is more or less important at the same time unless there's other good reasons that that shouldn't be the case thank you for that all right so the recommendation uh, for item six on page 20 is that the report be received um, i will so move uh, deputy mayor chesterman will second those in favor please say aye, aye. against carry thank you item um, number seven which is the recommended dates for reports to be presented to the Finance Committee. I'll move. Thank you. Seconder. Thank you, Councillor Tuman. Uh, those in favour, please say aye. Right. Against. Carried. Item number eight is the 10-year plan uh, monitoring report. Um, and I'll ask Ian and Raniel to um, present. <coughs> uh, Mr Chair, I have a few opening comments, if I may. A few. Yep. Um, the quarterly report that you have in front of you is for the period up till the 31st of December. Um, this has continued favourable financial results against Council's own balancing the books um, <coughs> measure with a 1.75 million year-to-date surplus under that measure. The accounting result is um, ahead of budget by less than a million dollars. Um, that's reflecting some uh, gains in revenue. Uh, um, being offset by particularly the unrealised gains and losses that occur with the, the financial instruments, particularly the swaps. Uh, that's in summary the results. Um, as it is a quarterly report, it also highlights the progress against the key performance measures. 
do you want any other staff at the end to present? So before we ask for questions, um, if there are any, um, Renil and Ian will report specifically to the um, to the items and the attachments, uh, the operating uh, result and the um, accounting measures, as well as capital expenditure and deferred capital expenditure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Councillors. Good afternoon, Your Worship. Um, as, as the CFO has just said, we have, uh, this is a report presenting on this, uh, the financial result for the Council for the uh, six months ended 31st December 2014. Uh, Council continues and has done for the last couple of years reporting a favourable position against both its operating accounting surplus or, or uh, bottom line as well as its bounce in the books target. Um, in respect to both those, the um, operating result was showing, as Paul said, uh, we're showing a surplus slightly under $1 million at 940000 And in respect, uh, that's the operating result. And in terms of the balance in the books target, we're showing a favourable result of $1.7 million. Um, in terms of the major drivers for that, excuse me, councillors. Um, uh, the, ma the major drivers for that, of course, is that if we, we go back and we have a look, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, expenditure, total expenditure, and I'm looking at page 36 on the statement of comprehensive income and expenses. Um, total expenses are running at about um, 297 favourable to budget, and that's made up of a number of favourable variances and unfavourable going across the four categories. Uh, revenue, on the other hand, is running favourable 10 million, uh, 10.2 million. And if we look down now, we look for the major drivers that are contributing to that. You'll see uh, the big number that stands out there is the two bottom numbers: uh, development and financial contributions, and other revenue. Um, the development contributions, as we've heard and uh, have been consistent um, reporting over the last couple of years, that continues to track well above budget. And at that point, I would just ask um, councillors if you just take, turn your attention to the main report on page. Excuse me, on page 31, you'll see in the section uh, entitled Development Contributions, it is on the second page, we've provided a graph this time round uh, which measures, uh, shows you the historic trends for the development contributions back to 2006 and then tracks through our projected uh, revenues um, over the, uh, for the next 10 years. I just want to stress though that those graphs go looking forward, those bar graphs looking forward are in fact the forecast from the uh, existing LTP, which is the 2012-2022 10-year plan, and clearly, um, as, as we speak, there is a, a draft document being prepared for the 2015-25 uh, <coughs> LTP, and, and these numbers have been revised upwards to reflect uh, the trend information that we, we have, the Council has seen over the last couple of years. Um, if we move back to the statement of financial, sorry, the uh, statement of comprehensive income, the other major driver for the very favourable revenue is in other revenue, we're showing um, 13.4 million against a target of 5.4, 7.9 favourable. Significantly driving that as a non-cash item, um, vested assets. Um, I'll just remind councils, vested assets is a non-cash item. It, it's revenue council recognises uh, when subdivisional development, both industrial and, and commercial and residential vests across the, to the city and we recognise the assets that the council requires and then takes ownership and control of. So if, um, to get the detail on that, if, if I ask you to go down to the bottom of that page under the bounce in the books measure, uh, you'll see vested assets there at 11.4 million. Um, and again, that leads in as, it, uh, as a non-cash item, we do eliminate it from the bounce in the books measure. Um, so overall, that puts us just in high level summary again, it does put us as, as a, in a favourable position against the budget on both those measures, um, which, which, is, which is a pleasing result going back to Council. Um, I'm, is there any particular questions Council would like to address in respect to the, uh, the operating results in terms of the statement of comprehensive income before I move on to some of the other areas being um, capital expenditure and risks and opportunities? Councillor Miller. Uh, just two questions, Ian. Um, we had a meeting the other day. We talked about the swaps. And I'm not, I don't want an explanation <laughs> of what swaps are. That's fine. Um, but you were going to. I asked you if can you identify the premium we pay, like then, because swaps are an insurance thing, and we pay a premium. What what is the premium we pay? Do you know? I, so I apologise if I don't quite get this right, Councillor Mallet. Yeah. So there's no fixed fee. There's there's, there's no um, charge that we pay for the swap. Effectively, when we enter into the swaps and 
For example, if we're swapping a variable rate for a fixed rate, the fixed rate that we are quoted and we, we, uh, we take on, that's going to have a margin within it that, that the, effectively that the bank it's has added onto it. And that's effectively the cost of the swap. So there's no... There's no invoice to say, oh, here's your swap, the cost of this one is X. So like, an, like with an insurance company, you might you might uh, insure your house for a million dollars, so that's the value of the swap, in effect. Mm. You're swapping your house for the with a million dollars. But there's a premium you pay, which might be $1,000. You, you, does, does you, you don't. That's not identified in a transaction, eh? No, there's no premium per se. No, not, not in that. Really, it's going to be embodied within the interest rate that we are paying, that, that, the, uh, that the margin that's in that rate that, the, that we get when we do the swap. There's, there's no premium. There's no separate fee. That's Mr. Chair, if I could make, yeah. make an additional comment to that. The, the way the pricing is set by the banks, they will be making a small margin between what they're offering us and what they're offering the So customer. there's a spread involved somewhere. There's a spread. Yeah. There's two parties. But that is not okay. visible to us. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and the other one was just on personnel costs on page 36. And I think I've raised this previously. Um, just so... If Members go down to uh, page 36, uh, uh, down to the second section, which is expenses. Personnel costs have gone up um, by about 10% over last year. Um, any obvious reason for that? So last year, last year to date, um, personnel cost was 27.8 million. They're now 30.6 million which is an increase of about 10%. Any obvious reasons for that? Because I, 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 it surprises me that our personnel costs are up 10%. Mr Chair, if so, I may... I think it's a, sorry to interrupt, but I think that's a question for the CEO. OK. I'm going to have to ask Paul to give you the details behind this. Yeah. On a, um... <laughs> Thank you. I, I could make some high-level observations, which I'm quite comfortable to do. I mean, I mean, one we're comparing last year's actual, this year's actual. I mean, we've one of the one of the factors driving it will be there's been inflationary pressures, there's been inflationary movements on on wage and salary costs for the organisation. Equally, uh, the budget would have indicated that there was going to be a, a, additional positions over last year, and those are being affected. That there have been other positions brought on board um, that you would say was outside the budget, but and they have been in all cases they have been weeks. Management have ensured at all times those any additional positions have been funded either through um, re reductions in other expenditure budgets and or um, additional revenue streams to, uh, to fund those. So okay, that, I guess that's what it, would help drive the difference between last year to this year. That yeah, it just it seemed a very it seemed a large increase to me. I mean, I wasn't aware that we we're up up ten percent on last year, um, so I wouldn't mind a little bit more analysis on how that occurred. I'm, I'm comfortable through the yeah. CFO to, to, to um, prepare a, a, a more detailed work paper, bring it through SCLT and back, back to this Thank um, you. committee. Councillor King. So on page 26, you've got personnel costs are unfavourable by $652,000. And then we've had $172,000 in redundancy payouts. That's correct, that's contributing to that unfavourable variance. So our personnel costs have gone up by over half a million dollars. Against but against the current budget, yes. Uh, I think I was talking about against last year, yep, yep. sorry. Yeah. Yep. And, and we've spent $172 million on redundancies. Why, why, yeah, $172,000. Why, why are we making people redundant? Can I ask the general manager, organisation development, to? And why? And then the other part of the question is why the costs so much higher when we're making when we're making people redundant. It just it all just raises questions. Are, are, are we? Why aren't we following a sinking lid policy if we're trying to downsize, or why are we paying to move people out, and why are our costs up by over half a million dollars? <coughs> and and I understand in the last council there was a huge reorganisation of staff to level this type of thing out and to bring some stability. Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, 
I need to go out and do a little bit more work to bring back some detail here to answer Councillor uh, King's questions. Um, I'll do that and bring something back after the break. From, from, in a, a general point of view, there will be um, uh, an ultimate goal is to ensure that we have the right staff in the right positions. And if there are opportunities to, um, when staff leave, not to replace them, we don't. But a number of the positions are to deliver specific pieces of work. So um, if staff do leave and we do replace them, that's because that role is needed. In terms of the restructuring costs and um, any redundancy costs, um, there will be ongoing savings probably in the year after. Um, you, if you paid restructuring costs out this year, then ultimately that's a cost and you have the ongoing savings in future years. But I concur with Ollie that we'll provide a more detailed analysis for that and for the query raised by Councillor Mallet in terms of comparison with the previous years to provide that information. As <coughs> I, I, I guess another question that could be considered also there is um, we, we've obviously um, approved a budget or the year-to-date budget was approved <coughs> at 30 million for personnel costs. Um, are we like? Are we going to remain within the annual budget for personnel costs for the remainder of the year? This 652 may, in fact, be a timing difference, and I suppose the 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 end result will be: will we will personnel costs fall within the budget? The, the the costs that were included in the annual budget. Yeah. So so that, that is a good question. There are a number of, like for example last year, a number of um, uh, moving past this, there are a number of units across this organisation that have um, a degree of casual labour as well based on the level of activity that are involved in those areas. So for example the pools and um, our events operations, they will have personnel costs that are offset by increased revenue that are associated with that activity as well. So to um, Ollie's point, in terms of an analysis, needs to consider both um, those, those drives as well as um, the other factors that have caused those um, variances as well. So it's not a straightforward answer. It can be quite complex. Thank you. And that certainly wasn't a straightforward answer. <laughs> hey, um, should this be on the um, risks and opportunities? Um, on a, our CFO. Yeah, uh, as the CEO has already commented, a large portion of this is offset by additional revenue, so that's... Well, if they're on the uh, risk so and opportunities, we can see that, can't we? But we can't right. see it the way it's presented at the moment. At the moment, that looks like a glaring $600,000 over-budget spend, and it's not explained. Yeah, we need to, we need, and we need clarity on that. Yeah, that's okay. correct. So, Chair, I have a question or a comment on this. Um, from my point of view, it is not acceptable that there be any overspend on salaries and wages as against the budget that we signed off. And that, <coughs> that message has been given loud and clear uh, every year. Um, that's number one. And number two, um, I also make an observation that I don't think it's acceptable to come to a meeting and not have the full answers to the matters set out in paragraph 23 because these are the variances. And while that is a summary of the variances and why, could I ask that the CFO ensure that when people come to these meetings, they can answer questions on the variables? Because that is the purpose of our questions, the variances. That's what we want to know the answers to. Um, I apologise, Your Worship. Yeah, thanks. So those are just a couple of comments to you. I, I think... Um, when it comes to wages and salaries, we have sent a clear message every year that there is to be no overspend on that budget figure. Councillor Mallet, same, so, so same, moving on, same area. Yeah, same area. So moving on from what uh, Her Worship said, um, do, we need to, uh, do we need to take the next step forward and instruct staff to come back with a plan to get um, salaries and wages back onto budget? Because at the moment, all they're going to do is explain why it's over. So I'm interested at uh, what it is at the end of the year. Because at the end of the year, that is, you know, we've set a budget. And at the end of the year, we expect the budget, the spent expenditure to meet yep. the budget. Full stop. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested in, in what is the movements along the journey and whether they are timing recoverable or we've got a mitigation strategy in place that will fix it. 
That's that's what I'm interested in. Those but three my point is that we need to have clarity. That yeah. As to so how all I'm interested is... in is is this timing? Is this is there a mitigation strategy in place, mm. knowing that there is no room for any movement on that figure? Yeah. Um, absolutely. That request uh, from her worship, we will work through to ensure that that. Uh, clarity is provided. Just to note though, um, whilst we focus on um, ensuring the uh, salarian wages are well managed and they are, and we just need the explanations to support that, we do manage the um, uh, cost in a total capacity. There are some decisions, for example, whereby they may well be budgeted at a consultant level. We may make a decision that it's more effective to use staff and vice versa. So we take a, a, a total view of those operating costs to ensure the most effective use and of personnel, whether they staff or contractors and so forth. So the general managers it may well be a mitigation, may well be saving money in other areas of their budgets in order to meet those obligations, but that will all be included in the summary we'll, we'll provide. Okay, thank you. Councillor King. Um, on, pay, on paragraph 46, page 30, on development levies, um, it says the annual forecast has been revised upwards to 10 million. So does that mean that the graph on page, at the top of page 31, does that flat line at 10 million per annum, as, as it says in paragraph 46? Through you, Mr Chair, the $10 million is an estimate for the current year, so that's the 2015-16 year. There are separate estimates for the future years that were outlined in the paper that was circulated to councillors when we were discussing the budget. Um, if I recall rightly, the uh, figure for the 2016 year, the 15-16 year, was a, a range of 9 to $11 million, um, and for the budget purposes, we had selected 9.5. Um, we have noted the drop-off in, in development contributions collected, particularly over December and, and January. Those are strong months, um, traditionally, but have been a lot weaker this year. Um, that reflects the fact that, as we have reported previously, there does appear to be some element of timing difference within the development contributions collection this year. Um, we've seen some developments that we expected to happen in the second half of the year actually uh, pay their fees earlier. Um, and that's flowed through um, into our estimates going forward. You don't think you're being conservative? Um, there is still an element of conservatism, but as, as um, our experience in December shows, that we had a collection <coughs> of, of just under $300,000 um, in a month, whereas in the prior months to that, we'd been collecting well in excess of a million dollars a month. So th there is a lot of uncertainty in mm -hmm. these numbers as well. So in paragraph 52, on page 31, so development contributions will be used, any favourable development contributions will be used to reduce debt? That's correct. Is that really going to happen? That, that's practice that we use at the moment, yes. So as, as they are collected, they reduce the debt until such time as the um, capital expenditure is actually completed. So over the next several years and we're likely to collect probably who knows but probably closer to 12 14 million we don't know but that money will won't be spent it'll 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 all go to reduce debt as it says in paragraph 52 the the estimates that we provided for the long term plan at 9.5 million dollars and, and approximately that level going forward is where we're expecting uh, that collection to be as you can see from the historical graph that level is actually above what has been co traditionally collected, um, other than in the 2014 year. So staff will recommend paragraph 52 in the future, that favourable income from de development levies will go to pay down debt. That has been the practice in the past and continues to be the practice going forward at this time, unless council changes its policy. But that will be staff recommendation, as in, as in paragraph 52. That's right. Thank you. Further questions or comments? Councillor Mel. Uh, thank you. Um, from the Risk and Opportunities uh, report, page 40, uh, we're advised that water revenue is down due to 
um, the loss of the customer, etc. And some, and this is um, this this eventuated from a discussion we had a couple of days ago with Ian and Renil. Um, there is some other issues with billing, isn't there? That is correct. Yeah. So I think those should be re um, revealed. Uh, the council should be advised of those. That there are invoices that were uh, sent out on time and things like that. So, so just just in a summary. So if, if you go back and have a look at the, in the financial um, statement of co uh, statement of comprehensive income and on page. Uh, I will to you page 36. <coughs> if you um, look at the second revenue line uh, below targeted rate uh, below rates excluding targeted rates, you'll see targeted rates for water supply. Uh, year to that actual 3.48 million budget 4.4 million that's showing an unfair, unfairable variance of 931. Um, as Councillor Mallet correctly pointed out, we've identified 450 of that as being a genuine loss in revenue through the loss of a, uh, an, a couple of major customers. Uh, the remaining is a timing variance um, through um, because of some of the billing issues. Um, that, that's, that's the fact, that's what's going on. I'd probably ask the General Manager Infrastructure to, to expand on that um, in terms of, of what's happening in that area. Uh, yeah, through you, Mr Chairman. So, um, um, second part, we are behind on the billing. I think we had some problems started emerging about 12 months ago with the performance of our contractor, um, which wasn't help that we didn't get onto it quickly enough. Um, so we've done two things. We initiated a pretty comprehensive end-to-end -end review of our water billing just prior to Christmas, um, and we're about to let a new contract for our water meeting, uh, for our meter reading. Um, so look, that, those two processes, particularly review, has resulted in a number of identified actions and fixes. Um, so look, they, we're very confident that it is a timing issue that we'll be back on track by the end of the year. So as of today, we're significantly um, caught up on the figure in front of um, you today. So um, yep, so it was a billing issue, but we're on top of it. Sorry, just to be clear, you, what you're saying is that uh, we had a contractor who was going and reading a water meter and was failing to report that back to us such that we could generate an invoice or they were reporting back to us and our staff weren't generating the invoice in time or a combination of both so it was a combination of both of poor information coming back um, but the information coming back was probably enough signals that we should have picked up and followed through so and we haven't in some cases um, so it's a combination of both it's led to the timing, uh, the timing variance. How many? I mean, we're talking. Are we talking dozens of invoices or hundred? I mean, there's not a lot of people, not an awful lot of people on meters, are there? Oh, th th this is it's a significant um, number. It's it's quite a it's a very complex. Was it hundreds? Meter is it? Reading. Um, yeah, it's it's thousands. <laughs> it's in the thousands. No, it's not in the hundreds. It's it's a big. Um, it's a big process, an end-to-end -end process. But previ really previously we've been able to get our invoices out and something happened. Yep, so as I say, a combination of the information coming from the contractor, but um, we didn't pick up on it quickly enough, But which is why we've initiated the review. We've got a good process going now with corrections and it will correct itself by the end of uh, this financial year. So presumably some of the customers will be getting a double bill somewhere along the line or something Yeah, they, like they won't be... Uh, build for water they haven't used, but there will yeah. be um, a double bill, as you say, so um, you know it's a catch-up sort of bill. So that that is a comms issue for us that we're considering and um, and talking to customers about. So you're confident you're on top of it now, and that it will. Yep. So as as of t today, we're we're certainly almost halfway um, through that um, catch-up with the, with the billing uh, having occurred. Mm -hmm. I just have a follow-up on the number because the general manager just said this already caught up a lot. To what extent? Because the variance is 931. So what's the variance actually today? So, so the variance of 931 is made up of two items. Yes, I got that. So, so what's the catch-up on the water meter? Yeah, so the so the water meter one, I think, mm. um, the timing variance is about 481. Mm. Um, thousand of that as of today. My information is about 175,000 of that has been built. And we've been through about a, a third of our routes. Have, have we certainty now that everybody, that we have everybody in the system or 
coming on to the system in terms of those who should be paying for water under water, uh, industrial water? There are some other actions um, from the review that there's some work streams looking at that issue as well in terms of are we just capturing everybody. So it's been quite a comprehensive review that we undertook and quite a number of actions to just um, look at our whole business. Does it look as if we have a large number who we're not, who are who, who are not paying the water rates? No, I, th I think there's an element of um, <coughs> zero meter readings, and um, it could be because the businesses that are just paying the standard rate and they're not using more than 120 cubic meters. But there's a process to go through and just identify whether they fit into that or what's driving the zero meter read. So they pay just in the ordinary rates. Their, ordin their yep. standard rates includes the, the water. Yep. So our, our water billing is um, something like um, a, a two hundred dollar fixed fee, and then a, a volumetric rate. So it's a fixed cost. So a lot of businesses don't use more than one hundred and twenty cubes, I think. So there's a minimum fee, but um, if you don't. Uh, if you use under a certain amount of water, you just pay the minimum fee and you don't pay a volumetric rate. Can I just ask chairs um, to the CFO, so the uh, loss of the customer because they've got their own uh, mechanism on site now, that the um, expected revenue has been adjusted then through the forecast financial statements for the 10-year plan? Yes, it has. Thanks. Councillor King. Um, page 25, paragraph 12. Uh, IT. There's an IT project that looks like it's in trouble or heading in trouble. What page, sorry, are you counting? Page 12. 25, 25. Uh, paragraph 12. The IT project. <coughs> so I can talk to that. Um, uh, through you, Mr Chair, so that was the comments I made earlier in terms of the action point. That relates to the um, issues we had in respect to the budgeting module within the financial system. The budgeting module itself works as the workflow process within the actual workflow. It's a technical process you use to manage individual <coughs> budgeting templates that get circulated out to the organisation. That aspect of the project has not gone live yet. We were awaiting for some um, fixes from the vendor. The vendor has now provided those fixes, and we are now basically waiting to allocate resource to test those fixes. And as commented in the action section, that will be addressed um, by April. A um, couple of points that I made earlier, it was never the intention to run the 10-year plan budgeting process through the Microsoft Dynamics um, budgeting tool, um, but we have actually used that budgeting tool to capture parts of the 10-year plan and it can be used. It's just this workflow process, which is an internal process to send a template from one staff member to another within the organisation to effectively approve aspects of the budget um, that doesn't work. But we've managed that through a, another process, and we always intended to have managed that through another process for this 10-year plan process as well. So <coughs> did you say earlier that there would be no cost overruns on this, that you didn't expect any? No, that, that's correct. Yep, that's correct. So the uh, fixes by the vendor are at their costs, and the resource to test it will be with an existing staff resource to test it. So there's no incremental cost, and we deliver the project within budget. So we're just monitoring it on a time scale, not a dollar value. Yep. So that's correct, Councillor King. We're monitoring it because it was flagged in the action as flagged in the action report. One small outstanding matter in respect of the workflow associated with budgeting had not been. Um, uh, uh, had not been delivered completely from the vendor and we are waiting to test what they have now provided, they've delivered, we just need to test it now and once it has been tested we will use it and um, as part of our regular budgeting process for the next annual plan process next year. Thank you. Before we move to see if there's any questions or discussions on rates and debtors and key projects and business cases, there is just one area that I'd like the staff with the uh, personnel expenses to perhaps do some work on uh, between now and perhaps reporting back to us. And it relates to page 59 on overheads. Um, and uh, if you look at the year to date, 
um, overheads are uh, the ex actual expenditure is 32 million four hundred uh, 32.4 million up from 27 million for the year to date last year which is a, a nearly a 20 percent increase and uh, just varying that uh, uh, just comparing that with budget we're about eight or nine percent ahead of budget and that's a wee bit of a worry that the overhead the actual overhead expenditure seems to be significantly higher than last year and 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 uh, nine nearly nine percent ahead of budget so could um, I ask the CFO um, to um, uh, if, if any comments on that at, at this stage and whether or not it should be referred back for someone to look more closely at why these variances have occurred very happy to provide some more information mr. chair I do note though that the revenue for that area is also up quite substantially against budget at the same time but but isn't the revenue just the revenue spread across the various departments when we're not actually receiving the, this is the revenue it's actually the revenue represents the the charges that are made across the organization and so that's simply been increased well I, I don't know it may yeah, well have been increased the, increased to cover the extra expenditure the revenue that's showing in this cost center here is is in fact um, the revenue that's associated with those costs again against the overheads therefore it is actually reducing what is allocated as overheads across the rest of the organization so, so the revenue where's that spend? revenue come from no. Paul? Uh, numerous lines of revenue I'm, I'm sorry but it's, um, Ian it's just you a charge it. against internal cu um, customers so it's not revenue yeah it's, it's a it's a debit goes against transport and a debit goes against to strategic and a debit goes against someone else in the credit, credit to, to, It's not external revenue. No, it's, it's, uh, 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 could, could we get uh, get, get some get, clarity on it? I think rather than, yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah. I, I don't have the exact numbers in front of you, but the majority of revenue uh, that is recognised by overhead and support units within council is generated through internal charging mm. to other council units, yeah. mm. whether it be the IT department, the property department, yeah. or whatever it would be. Yes, mm. the, there are some external revenue streams coming through uh, into those areas, but I, I don't have the exact breakdown in front of me. I, we will get that though and, yeah. it and supply it back to the council. Okay, so that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Okay, so um, can we have? Is there any discussion on rates and debtors or key projects and business cases, which are covered on pages 32 and 33? You want to present? Oh, sorry, you, you, you've got to present. Uh, 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 sorry, through the chair, I was just hoping to make a um, just a build presentation <coughs> with respect to the capital expansion position as well as the risks and opportunities, which are also sections embodied within the main report. Uh, if, if you were yep. happy. No, I, have, I, I, I thought we had already covered that, uh, or we certainly covered some questions in respect to risks and opportunities, but happy for you to um, uh, explain anything in there that might um, be of value. I'd just like to bring to Council's attention, while we, we've talked about the operating result and there's some crossover risk and opportunities, the other, uh, one of the other areas I want to talk about was that on page 28 of the report, uh, the capital expenditure, deferred capital expenditure section. Uh, it's another significant part of Council's um, spending program. Um, our capital program for the current financial year stands at $81 million. That's our budget. That's made up of an approved budget of $67.9 million, plus the approved deferrals from the previous financial year at $13.2 million. That, that, that's what makes up our total spend. As at the end of December, Council had spent $23.7 million against that. Uh, which in respect to the budget that we measure against, we were 29% behind that uh, with 13.4 million. Um, and that leads us into explaining why that significant variance is occurring. Uh, if we have a look down, uh, while a number of them are timing, we, we have identified four significant projects that contribute to that variance. Uh, two of them, staff for management are flagging as deferrals for this financial <laughs> year. Uh, the first one is the, um, uh, the new Rotaturna Reservoir. Uh, that, that project will now will not complete this year in, in the way it was intended, so there's a deferral being flagged there. And the other one, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the quantum of that, that's four and a half billion on the reservoir. The other significant project is the Hamilton Ring Road, um, that again being flagged as a deferral, um, that's 11 million. So what we're saying is that at the six month mark, two projects on the total capital program being identified as deferrals, totaling 14.5 million. Um, so give us some context. Last year, total deferrals were 13.2, but 
Um, that represented 33 projects, so it's only those two this year that we're flagging, and, and clearly um, the ring road 11, 11 million is a, con a significant factor. The other two contributing factors are another two infrastructure projects, a project for the dewatering facility at the water treatment station. That project has now been, in, in, in essence, um, cancelled, and the funding through council approval has been deferred to other um, operate, uh, other um, projects, uh, namely the um, chlorine scrubber, as well as some operational costs, and those works still have to occur. And the other one is the project for the, um, the new structure to extract water from the Waikato River. Again, the, that's subject to a business case, which I believe is being heard later yeah. on, the, on, the, on the agenda today. So having said that, um, capital expenditure is below, uh, but management uh, are flagging at this stage that only two projects um, are subject to deferral, uh, indicating that the rest of the program will be de uh, delivered uh, by the 30th of June. Um, 2015. So just to comment on that, what we're saying is that we're still not completing and getting anywhere near our CapEx expenditure and and good on you for putting your hand up and saying, yep, we're not going to do it, but it's, it hasn't got any better. I mean, I've, it's just the figures I've got, as at um, November when we looked at our September results, we were 24% on our capital expenditure. As at December, when we looked at our end of October results, we were 30% behind. And now we're 36% behind. So there's, and we're six months through the year. So, and I know you're just the messenger. Um, uh, and to to sort of flag it away by saying, well, we've actually identified the big ones we're going to miss out, doesn't make it any better. Um, six months ago, we approved budgets that said we were going to do these things. We set our rates based on um, borrowing a certain amount of money, which therefore uh, said we we're going to incur some interest rates, which was going to be factored into the the rates we charged our customer, our, our rate pass. Um, there might have been a little bit of appreciation for any of those projects that got finished within the year, which we also factored into our rates. Um, we've collected the money from the community. Uh, the community haven't got the projects that we've committed to do. Um, so I know everyone rolls your eyes when I talk about deferrals, but it's getting no better. In fact, it's getting worse. Um, and I don't know whether this council is going to ever <coughs> have the apple to do anything about it or not. So if I could just make a comment, mm. not that I want to disagree with you, Councillor Mallet, but I mean, yes, the deferrals, you say, are getting worse. I mean, last year, the 13, you know, there were 13 million. This year, we're, we're flagging them at 14 and a half. But I think for me, it's only two projects. We're only identifying two projects that we're saying are unlikely to complete this year, and we're putting a hand up now. Last year, that 13 million was represented as 33 individual projects. So it makes no difference. I mean, it, uh, whether it's the value of the it's the value of the projects that matters. And, and yeah, and if I if I may, Mr. Chair, um, I would also remind the councillor that um, of of those projects, one of them has grants associated with it. For, so the net cost to council is actually nil. Um, so we're talking an amount at this stage estimated at 4.5 million for year end, which is a substantial improvement on the 13 million. Yep, and we've got really good at rationalising all this stuff away, haven't we? But it, it it just happens every single year, and it's been happening not just for one year; it's been happening for a decade. You know, every council does it, and somewhere along the line, we have to accept that we are not capable of of, of completing the capital project we started with at the year of the end of the year. And history for the last 10 years has proven that. So we need to start being less aggressive on our capital expenditure. Excuse oh, can me, I make Chair. a comment? Excuse, yeah. Yeah, so excuse me, Chair. I, I, with respect to Councillor Mallet and very articulate uh, presentation, um, we have uh, finance officers here, and their job is to answer our questions. And um, I want to... I, I'm not interested in a particular council's summary of the finances... I'm interested in the CFO and the CEO's, uh, you know, interpretation of these matters. So, can I please have again clarity on how we run a capital expenditure budget? Again, please. And is that the CEO or is it the CFO? Um, I don't think we need every other staff member putting their two bulbs worth in. We have a CEO and a CFO. So could you explain how we run the capital expenditure budget again, please? Okay. The capital expenditure budget is estimated through a long-term plan process initially. It is set over a 10-year uh, period, of which three years are calculated in detail. The, um, 
The estimates are then uh, allocated to particular years, and those um, uh, projects are estimated both from a cost and a time point of view as to when is the best time for those to occur. There is um, uncertainty in all of those budgets, uh, both from a timing point of view and from a value point of view, um, and that certainly um, is reduced as we get closer to producing a business case. The business case um, ultimately sets the value for the project, and th uh, that project then commences. In some cases, we are working now on um, estimates that are three years prior to the business case, which is, in some cases, in the agenda today. So uh, from that point of view, there is uncertainty across that period. It is difficult for any organisation to actually produce a capital budget and achieve that budget um, in, a, in a particular year. I do acknowledge Councillor Mallett's query as to um, how we can improve that. Um, we have been making substantial efforts to improve that level. And this year, as I've already indicated, we're looking at a $4.5 million net variance for Council, compared with the $13 million that was achieved last year, and substantially more in historical years. There is ongoing work to improve the way that we deliver on time and on budget these, these capital projects. But there is still uncertainty when those estimates were originally created three years prior. Uh, my next question is in terms of the timing during the year for capital projects. Uh, those, the timing of the delivery of those is not regulated as an X amount this month, X amount next month through the year. Am I correct about that? It's seasonal yeah. or it's dependent on third parties, etc. There, there is some dependency on third parties, that's correct, Your Worship. Mm. Um, we are um, reliant on procurement processes that may take slightly longer or less time to actually complete. We're also reliant on, on the final values for those projects which are reported through the business case processes. There is an attempt to seasonalise mm -hmm. where possible, but obviously that is done at a gross level that says these are summer projects versus winter projects. Mm. It is very hard to actually estimate until those, until those final uh, procurements are completed to know exactly when the costs are going to mm -hmm. fall. And the final question I have is, this council can approve or not approve mm. uh, deferral capital expenditure? That's correct. Right. So we can choose to say, bad luck, we're not agreeing to that, and that project will be removed. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think, uh, Chris, did you have a comment to make? Um, sorry, I was just going to add to that, because a lot of the expenditures in my area, so look, we do at management operate on a, a, a use it or lose it general philosophy in terms of spending it, and it's a real hard threshold at a management level to put forward a case for uh, capital deferral. Um, so in my area I've got two there, one of them the uh, Rotatuna um, Reservoir, that, that we can touch on those issues today in the business case. Um, the Ring Road is a big one and I do have some um, issues there that we're working through and we're coming to strategy and policy. But I think we are quite unique in terms of our reliance on third parties. So a lot of the rest of my programme is how we engage with developers and we are reliant on the developer coming to the table. We're, we're guessing in advance of the developer and how the developer is going to move. Now, for instance, the um, I've put on the watch list there, if you like, paragraph 36, the roading and Rotatuna. So we've put it on a watch list, but there's $3 million tied up with there with two developers that have come to council. One is the Ministry of Education and the other one is Colin Litt. So um, we are at the point where we're about to um, sign both agreements in accordance with the paper we brought up to Council, uh, but it's driven by the developer and when they're ready. Um, both of those projects, um, uh, the Ministry of Education, we've tendered. Tenders uh, were open and we've evaluated yesterday, so we're ready to go. So we're largely going to spend all the money on both of those projects, I'm very confident. It's on the watch list because it might just go into next year and some of the commissioning, but we're largely on track with that. Um, there are other projects in, in here where we've anticipated developers being ready to go, but the developers are not ready to go. So we'll get to the end of the year and there'll be some funding um, in the growth area, which we um, do not spend. 
Now, we won't be looking to carry it over because we've reset in the 10-year plan our expectations of, from development and what the market is going to do. But I, I think, just to re-emphasise the point, I think we're very unique in terms of our reliance on um, third parties. Occasionally we'll have projects and things in our control where they don't quite go our way, um, like, like, like any company delivering projects. But the, the size for us is unique in terms of our reliance on third parties. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks, Chris. Okay. Um, well, I was, I was <coughs> going to go back to Ian. Um, okay. Are we, are we going to move on from, or have we, have we, have we completed the discussion on deferred expenditure? <coughs> I had no, I nothing further to add on deferred expenditure. You have nothing further no, to say? No, just, no, okay. Just, do you want to continue? Make sure everyone knows what the position is. Yeah. Um, Look, I was if I was going to make a comment oh, earlier on um, before sorry. The, yeah. uh, her worship spoke, uh, in response to Councillor Mallet, who who uh, I was very forth with with his comments around deferral, my comments were exactly the same. That if Councillor Mallet decided that uh, certain projects <laughs> needed to be halted for whatever reason, then he always had the ability to. Um, has the ability to, to suggest those decisions for council. <coughs> so if we wanted to stop the ring road midway or nearly as it's nearly completed, who was, anybody has that opportunity to make that suggestion to council. The issue is not stopping a project. The issue is, and during the planning phase, being realistic about what we can achieve. And that's the uh, problem. We, I'm um, not going to enter into a discussion to, with it. Well, you just did, didn't you? All right, let's, um, let's move on then to look at um, um, the, um, the, the debtors and the key projects. Uh, 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 do you have any comment? Have you, got, have you anything to present in respect to that part of the report? So, I swear to the Chair, not, not in respect to uh, the um, rates and debtors sections. I, I was going to um, just uh, make Council aware of that section 48, risks and opportunities, uh, and, and on the narrative, and that refers to the schedules that you will find starting on page 40, um, page 40, uh, 41, 42 and 43. And uh, because this is a six monthly report, we, we bring up the risk and opportunities through the council and in summary uh, on the operating and maintenance um, performance of the council, uh, we're showing that we're unfavorable on those activities at this point in time of 1.4 million, 1399. And on capital, unfavorable, one. One million, and, and the detail and the, and the reasons for um, those um, those numbers are detailed in the in the schedules on those pages. Uh, and again, stress that um, management work uh, throughout the year to deliver a bottom line zero or a net impact zero and bring that back with, with no um, negative impact on the bottom line. To that end, we are ex specifically this year when reporting risk and opportunities, we are no longer bringing favourable um, uh, favourable results from interest. Uh, cost and from development levies and using those to offset. So if you refer to section 53 within the report, you'll see that we say that overall, from an accounting point of view, the operating result will be favourable $2 million. But when you start to analyse that down, the reason that's favourable $2 million is because uh, we're sitting on a favourable position of three and a half, $3.4 million from interest. So we're excluding that, so we're not taking that onto the bottom line. So what management are, are managing towards is that deficit of 1.3, and again, that the individual projects are detailed as to why that's occurring, and again, stressing that uh, by end of year, that's going to come back to zero. Right, thank you. Any, any discussion on the risks and opportunities? Uh, Councillor King. Can I just go back a bit to debt? Um, I see in paragraph 24, on page 27, we have a, a written layout of where our debt levels are. What is there a graph? There is no graph in this report today, no, Councillor. I, I, at a previous meeting, it was discussed that we'd stay with the same matrix of graphs that we'd had and that was in writing in a report. <coughs> and when I asked you, Paul, I think you said you would include it from now on. That, that is a recall, Councillor, was a budget meeting in relation to the budget graphs, the three graphs, yes? Yeah. And uh, my apologies, I did not realise that you were also expecting to see those three graphs in, in the quarterly finance reports. Traditionally, ha have we not had those graphs in these reports? Not to my knowledge in this report, no. Uh, 
uh, and previously, we've, sorry, um, through you, Mr. Chair, um, Councillor King, we've always taken a tabular approach to um, the total overall debt number within this report. That was a reconciliation that was requested by um, the Chair to explain the difference between total external debt and total overall debt. On paragraph 24. In paragraph 24, thank you. Yes, that's correct. Yep. Thank you. I, I just thought in a finance report like this, it would be a useful tool to have graphs showing where we are with debt and also with our 200% debt to debt ratio as referred to in paragraph 8, 3.8. Thank you, Councillor. I'll take that feedback on board. Councillor Mallet. It's showing a history and you know, our projections. Thank you. Are we moving on to the activity reports? Do you want to do that? Um, well, we're considering the whole of the report okay. at the moment, yes. Okay, so just one, in the activity reports at page 49, under City Prosperity, um, and we discussed this the other day, Ian, uh, variant explanation. The second point is Claudeland delivered a positive revenue result of $180,000. Now, we discussed this the other day about cherry-picking the figures that you um, report upstairs. I, I asked, I, I did a written response, you know, asked Ian a whole lot of questions. It turns, I said, what is the actual result for Claudelands year to date? Turns out the overall result for Claudelands uh, as at the 31st of December is a net loss of 4.975 million compared to a net loss of 4.726 million um, December 2013. So any reader of this re report, to the extent that they got any information about Claudelands would have thought, oh, it, it, Claudelands is doing okay. It's $180,000 revenue better. But in actual fact, it's um, on target to be about four or 500000 dollars less than last year, uh, worse off, a bigger deficit than last year, and the deficit is trending again towards another $10 million deficit for Claudelands. So I guess my comment is, um, uh, give us the full picture rather than cherry picking, because I think that that comment about um, Claudelands is quite misleading, and I appreciate you are only the messenger. We'll take that on board, Councillor Mallet and reports going forward. Yep. All right, well, I'd, I'd like to move the adoption of the report, um, which is, let me get back to where we... Could I just ask another question? Uh, recommendation from management, yes. Just on page 99, um, this, through the chair, this might be for Sean. under the risk description as a result of exhaustion and low morale the key project staff a flow on loss of focus and drive to meet you can read it there Sean is that your comment uh, yes through the chair um, that's certainly a valid comment that we put into that report uh, some months ago because the uh, project was certainly causing a lot of stress, especially with the heavy workloads that were going on at H3 at the time. We introduced some uh, mitigation of that, uh, which I uh, think has been successful, and that did cause some short-term increases in salaries where we took on some temporary staff to, to help us through that, um, that um, phase. Uh, and we are out of that, and this report, the next time you see this report, there will be a closeout report and uh, we're very happy with the outcome and the way it's uh, turned out. But it was certainly a problem that concerned us late last year. So where would you put a rate raise, or, um, the risk raising now? Uh, right now we're all green. It's, it's all go. The project is effectively completed and we are doing the sign-off report next week. Thank okay. you. All right, well, I'd like to move uh, <coughs> under paragraph 15 that the report be received and the risks and opportunity schedule be received. Do I have a seconder, Deputy Mayor Chesterman? Any discussion on the motion? Those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. <coughs> Item number nine is uh, IES programme of uh, work update. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Your Worship, Councillors. This is the uh, regular report update of the IS 
program of work, I'll introduce uh, Mark Donnelly, who is our acting program manager, sitting in for David Gunn, CIO, who's at a briefing in Auckland. Uh, one change, uh, page 112, uh, table under uh, point 18, finance management uh, line, project status should read live. Uh, apart from that, um, take oh, Sorry, can you just repeat that again? Sure. Um, which, uh, which line? Page 112, uh, 18, line financial management, project status should read live. Um, it's just a minor point, the project's gone live. Oh, I see, okay. Apart from that, uh, take the report if you're happy to take any questions. Thank you. Councillor Mallet. Just a point of clarification, is Oli, uh, Oli um, I see on our agenda this is page 112, but it's actually page 110, isn't it? Isn't it? Is that right, this, this report? Yeah, the, the oh, yeah, copy okay. I've got, it's, uh, the report's on page 110, that's correct. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, on, so on page 111, which is the second page of the report, there's a table, uh, P, PIF 12049 and 12050. There's uh, three columns, total long-term budget 2012-22, total expenditure to date, and then current financial year approved budget, and current financial year expenditure. Could you just sure. just explain what those mean? To you, Mr Chair, that's a combination of OPEX and CAPEX for that mobility project. It's detailed <laughs> in the uh, mobility business case that's attached. To that, I can assure you that the uh, mobility CAPEX side of that mobility business case will be expended by 30 June. Okay, so um, the first column is the total budget that was given to each of those projects through the 10-year pl uh, plan. The second bit's how much you've spent from day one, not just this financial year, is that right? So 240,917? Got the same figures? Yep. I understand that to be this financial year. Councillor Mellick. Um, so, okay, so that's this financial year. But even though it says total expenditure to date, because, I mean, this 10-year this, um, plan started three years ago, didn't it? Yeah, we've, uh, through you, Mr Chair, we've spent, I understand we've spent more uh, than that uh, throughout the duration of this project. My understanding is that is uh, total expenditure to date for this financial year, column two. Sorry, I didn't... I didn't My understanding is that column two, uh, total expenditure to date, is for this financial year. It ju you mean it just so happens that this financial year was the only time you've spent money on this project, or is that, that, that that's inaccurately labelled? Uh, it's inaccurately labelled. Okay, so that should say total expenditure this year. That's okay, that's my understanding, yes. So, okay. so what does the next figure mean, the yeah. current FY expenditure? Oh. <laughs> you go. Okay. go for it. No, sorry, Rob was again asking exactly what I was going to say. Okay. So that's the combined OPEX and CAPEX for the mobility project. So there's an operational expenditure component of that as well as a capex combined together, and that's detailed on the first page of the mobility business case. Okay, so does what tells us how much we spent on this project in in total? Where does that be reported in there? <coughs> Yeah, that's not that's not reported on this table. I can get that uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Get that figure for you. That need that needs to be reported. Eh? So yeah. we need to know what the total budget is, what the budget what might I don't know. In one way, you might want to do total budget, total budget up till the start of this year, then the bu total budget this year, total and total already spent over and under budget. You know, because that that was I just found that quite confusing. Whether we're whether we're under control or whether we're blown out or what we were. Through you, Mr. Chair. I'll take that point on board, and in the next report we'll bring an updated table to reflect that. Thank you. So, so just to be very clear, um, how much have we spent in total on the first one, 12,049? 240,000. That's expenditure this financial year. Sorry. Do you know, so we don't, that this report doesn't show us what we've spent from... From the beginning of the project? Yeah. From, no, no, it doesn't. Okay. So we're not too sure how we're going on budget on that. Well, this report doesn't show us how we're doing on the, in total with that, that 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 initial budget, does it? Okay. So when, when when will you report next to us? The next finance meeting, we'll get a, another report just to let us know where we're going on this particular project and what the spender has been. 
Uh, uh, yes, we can do that, or we can bring it to the next um, scheduled reporting date for the ICE programme of work. Okay, which is the next finance meeting, is it? Uh, I'd have to go back to the, uh, the schedule. I believe it's the one okay. after next. Okay. It, it would be useful for this to be a little bit clearer, I think, in terms of... Yep. Understood. Okay. Any dis further discussion on this report? Taking it as read. Um, recommendation for management is that the report be received. Oh, sorry, can I have one more question? Do you know what we've spent so far in total? You haven't got that in the back of your head, or David, or... So, so we're OK on this? So you, Mr Chair, yes, we are. Very comforting, thank you. OK. <laughs> All right, so the so re recommendation is that the report be received. Um, would somebody like to move that? Thank you, Deputy Mayor Chesterman. Have a seconder. Thank you, uh, Councillor Tooman. Any discussion? Those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against, carried. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Solly. Thanks. Okay, item number 10 is the community occupancy applications. Thanks, Lance. I'll take the report as read. I'm um, happy for you to speak to it. A uh, reasonably comprehensive report, Mr Chairman. Just a couple of points. I um, just wanted to highlight Hamilton City Bowling Club. Um, the reason why the recommendation is for two years is that there's um, pretty much a bunch of work going on with... Um, the club and the squash club next door and working with Sport Waikato in line with really some of the objectives of the community occupancy policy and um, around um, sustainability of clubs going forward and um, trying to get hubbing and joint use of facilities. So uh, the reason why the recommendation is um, for uh, granting a two-year lease um, for them to see if they can... Um, work up a sustainable partnership model with the Hamilton Squash Club going forward. So there's, there's quite a bit of work been happening around that. Uh, the second one is a, um, an uh, application from the Riding for Disabled who operate um, at the back of our, you'll see on the map of the back of our land um, that we have at the um, Newstead Cemetery. And you can see from the report that the RDA moved there some time ago um, with some assistance from council and some considerable expenditure um, to their operation um, when uh, council moved them on from Foreman Park for the reasons outlined in the report. Um, as the policy and guidelines allow, um, uh, people can apply for exceptional circumstances. Uh, we've had um, with the uh, rent um, re renewal, uh, rent increase and decrease notices going out um, prior to Christmas about um, what takes effect on the 1st of January. We've only received um, two applications for exceptional circumstances, and uh, RDA is one, and that the policy and guidelines allows really for staff and my position to actually make a recommendation to council or not, um, whether it should consider exceptional circumstances. So we've had a we've had a careful look at this. We've been working closely with the um, Riding for Disabled Waikato group. Um, Sally's team and our finance people have had a good look at their financial statements um, for the past few years and, and really weighed that up. It, um, their request against the criteria and the policy and the guidelines around ex exceptional circumstances. Now, we've outlined in the report um, pretty the uniqueness of, of this group compared to, and no disrespect to other groups um, using um, council land or facilities, their uniqueness compared to sports clubs and other community groups. And obviously they provide a, um, for want of a better term, a, a holistic um, practical uh, therapy type um, operation for um, uh, people who are disabled or um, um, in a number of ways. Um, so the, the benefit from this is significant to the community. Um, probably the other uniqueness is that their operation relies on using horses, um, which uh, have some 
a whole bunch of variables involved, um, and land management's one of them. Um, animal health is another, which um, if anyone's involved in horses, uh, will know that um, you know one day they can be fit and healthy, and the next day you're calling in the farrier or a vet at you know considerable cost. So, so they've got a whole bunch of variables in their operation. Um, they have had some challenges around um, uh, donations and grants, and you could say yes. Well, other groups have that. Um, we've we've had a look at the way they're operating, and uh, they, in our view, they are a, a group which. Um, uh, are well organised, have a lot of volunteers, and um, uh, run in a very um, prudent way. Um, but they do have some challenges, and they're saying that um, you know they've had some problems around getting grants. Um, they've had some challenges around costs, and um, they have a number of their um, users of what they provide with significant community benefit who come from. Um, uh, socioeconomic circumstances which you know make it challenging for them to put their fees up to those people considerably um, so um, you know four thousand dollars you know they've got a hundred thousand dollar operation basically their um, revenue and um, their their expenses but four thousand dollars to them is uh, you know a considerable sum and would cause them some problems they they're very loath to pass the cost on to the users and um, they believe that uh, they um, uh, would have some issues. The, the other thing we need to bear in mind is, um, if we have in our policy, is to look at what other options have they got. Uh, look, the reality is them moving somewhere else um, because the rent is too high um, uh, probably isn't an option. Um, there is another riding for disabled uh, working, at, uh, working out of the, um, uh, the Waikato Equestrian Centre at Tarapa, which is also council land and um, they uh, wouldn't have room for a number of horses and um, users of, of um, the group from Newstead. Um, so the reality of them being able to move somewhere is pretty limited. Um, a couple of other things is uh, long-term occupancy. They're well aware that uh, the land they're on is, is really a land-banked expansion area for the Newstead Cemetery, and that at some stage uh, then they will uh, in the first instance, have less land to graze and have their horses on, and B, in the long term, they will um, will have to uh, move on from there. But obviously, that's 50 or 60 years down the track, depending on the mortality rates in, in Hamilton and the Waikato area. Uh, the other thing is alignment to our disability policy. We do have a policy which talks about um, uh, supporting people and providing equity and access. Um, we've done a bit of benchmarking, which is outlined in the report. Uh, which um, you know you can read what's in the report. It, um, it talks about uh, what the ranges, what other RDAs pay in New Zealand, and um, we don't believe it will set a precedent. We haven't had a whole bunch of groups lining up for um, exceptional circumstances, um, and we believe that the uniqueness of their operation, um, uh, you know, just shows they are a bit different from. Um, other other organisations that use um, our land or or buildings. So in summary, um, we've recommended that um, there is exceptional circumstances. Uh, we've talked to the group and said, well, if you do end up with a a good year and you have a benefactor who comes along with you know and gives you a whole bunch of money, then um, we need to review this. So what in our recommendation, we've actually suggested that um, we review the situation in, um, uh, in <coughs> 2018 as part of the review of the um, per square metre rate, which is in our policy, um, which, which we'll be doing um, to set that percentage of market rate. So, so we believe we've um, um, been true to what the policy and the guidelines say, and um, that we um, provide some flexibility for review in the future as we work with them and, and keep a handle on their circumstances, and if those circumstances change to a um, a more favourable situation. I'll leave it there, Mr Chairman. Happy to answer any questions. Thanks, General Manager. Uh, questions? Councillor Gallagher. Yeah, um, thank you. It's a good report. I'll be uh, foreshadowing uh, moving an amendment to test the RDA's request for 2187 per annum. Um, just to clarify, and this is a really good report, I'll just do a couple of questions on the RDA first, and I want to quickly look at the bowling club. 
Um, you, you talk about benchmarking. The proposed rental is significantly greater than RDA, page 144, than RDA groups elsewhere with a range of mil to 1,500 per annum. Um, so we, would we be the only local authority charging the RDA this kind of money? And, I, and I'm complimenting you on your report because what your report is, is at least recommending back to the status quo, which is a plus, but we're still way outside anywhere else in the country. Is that correct? That, that's correct, but I think you just need to realise as we, when we went through the formulation of the policy and did benchmarking, um, there wasn't a lot of uniformity across local mm. authorities and their policies. Oh. Some had peppercorn rentals for every community mm. occupancy. Some had um, historic rentals, a mixture of those, and, and um, others um, had variation between commercial rents and um, you know cheaper rents depending on the type of um, operation that, that was um, residing on the land. So there was no hard and fast benchmark. Mm. So we've just actually, this benchmarking is around RDAs. Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously um, other councils have had, um, you know, either driven by policy or not in what they've sure. charged. Sure. The, um, and I'll also, just on needy groups, the cadets who are in the East Town Belt, have you, is there any movement you've talked you've had with them and I know Councillor Chesson has been involved around issues of premises and stuff like that. Is, is this particularly relevant to this discussion? Well, well, well what, I, what, what the um, GM talked about is, I guess I'll rephrase the question, what other um, applications have you had? Um, so, so this is application this for reduction, yeah, for remission. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other one is the uh, the croquet club at Galloway Park. Right. So, okay. so, so as as the policy says, if if I'm going to bring bring a recommendation forward, um, then the first thing I do is look at the eligibility criteria, and one of those is sustainability and yeah. that sort of thing. So, so we're working with the croquet club at the moment. Sport Waikato and looking at um, their whole operation and you know another situation where they might want to partner another group going forward but you know um, we haven't got to the end of those discussions yet so we're still working that through. So with the cadets is there any discussion? I know, just I'd have to defer to Sally or Renee on that. And I'm, a, I'm a happy to go back offline on that one if you want, if you want to. Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. If I can, through the Chair, um, yes, we are still working with the cadets and I'm happy to provide you with an update offline. Okay. No, that, that, that's fine. So that's one in, in progress. Okay, with regard to the City Bowling Club, given the fact that this is obviously an incredibly prime site uh, and, you know, we have lots of uh, community organisations that, that, in terms of the building structures, could be really good tenants, is two years a gen quite a long time? I mean, I'm not wanting to and all, to all compromise what I th where I think you're going on this with Sport by Cato and the, and the squash people, but it seems to be this that location is quite a jewel in the crown, and we're in a situation at the moment of only having 55 members. Yeah, so um, they're, they're very open to looking at multi-use, mm. and that's something that Sally and I have discussed for... Um, a wee while now. Um, they're, they're, they're quite proactive on that. Some of that's outlined in the report. Yes, yes. But they, um, they're having, you know, close discussions with the squash club about that whole precinct. Mm. They, look, they are very mindful of the strategic location and mm. the, you know, the quality of the facilities and the mm. asset. Um, I think we need to be a bit careful that um, uh, the, the, the asset, which is, you know, geared up for essentially a sports club bowling yeah. type operation, just didn't quickly become something else. But um, you, you have to look at the you know the way it's built and the and the layout and that sort of thing. But it does lend itself to other things. We've suggested yeah. during the day cause could they have other community groups um, operating in there and they have their bowls and yeah. you know futsal, soccer, and, and different yeah. things that they are looking at um, on the on the greens. Um, you know after hours or on the weekend. So you're saying a two-year, I mean, my own perspective 
would be that a two year would be kind of a max because you'd want to get some resolution and, and yep. I can see the huge potential but it, it wouldn't yep. want to go much beyond that. Yeah, so, so I think yeah, I think we've got to realise that we're you know we're dealing with volunteer organisations yeah, too, yeah. and they've got you know and, and there's some good people there. You know, yes, Mr. Barwood, indeed. we're dealing with is, you know, he's, um, you know, does a lot of work there. He's um, very um, good lateral thinker and, and working with the squash club. So I think so I think two years we um, you really need to give them a, a reasonable amount of time, but hear what you say about a finite amount of time as well. You know, and as you say, the lateral thinking, which is that's thank thank you. Mr Chair, I'll at the right time be moving an amendment. Uh, Thank you. Councillor O'Leary. Thanks. I just have a um, question for clarification. They, um, your recommendation is to keep the rent status quo, so to not go with the increase under the new policy. Their application is asking for a rental of lower than what they have now. What was their reasoning for that? Sally? And I'm assuming their rental at four has been that way, you know, uh, adjusted over the years for increase in what we've done over the board. But I just don't know why they would come back at half of what that is quite was. If I can, through the chair, um, my understanding is the the amount they sought rental for was based on um, what <coughs> one of the neighbouring properties was paying to Grace. And so that's where they got their that was that was a commercial commercial arrangement, was it? The grazing on the neighbouring property. Yes, I believe so. Okay. <coughs> okay. So why aren't they going there? Because they have significant facilities on our land. There's, there's a lot of hard infrastructure there. There's buildings and stables and yards and mm. fencing and a whole bunch of stuff. So, so it's not actually a per acre request. Um, Comparison at all? It's no. I, I, I think I think I think what they you know they're comparing with just a straight grazing lease or license you know that you might do with On a farmer or something like that. Yeah. Um, this is a little bit different. Okay. Uh, Deputy Mayor Chesterman, did you did you have a question? Did you have a question? No. <laughs> Councillor Truman. Yes, yeah, Chairman. With the with the bowling club. God help us, we've got 11 bowling clubs in Hamilton. And this bowling club we're talking about, there's another set of greens which might be 150 metres away at the Hamilton Working Men's Club. This club here has got 55 members, and I noticed previously they've been paying $6.63 a year to actually play bowls there. Um, how far do we go? <laughs> and I think what we have to do is we have to take a lead somewhere along the line. Uh, when you look at what Sport Waikato have done, and if we don't actually take a stand, I think we're just going to uh, continue down the same track. Uh, yesterday I heard there's 48 golf clubs in Waikato. Um, how many golf clubs, how many bowling clubs and that do we actually need? So I think if we sort of take a bit of a stand, it might force some of the amalgamations which could take place. I think the issue has been identified, hasn't it, and you're working with them too. So I think Councillor Toomans hit on a good point. Um, just, just some of the further background to this is that um, there's been a lot of discussion with this club about amalgamating with other clubs. Um, been a lot of discussion and um, you know, no resolution. That's why we've got Sport Waikato involved um, in the squash club. So they're actually looking at um, uh, using the centre, it won't just be for bowls, what are the other opportunities? Is it croquet, is it futsal on those two back greens, those sorts of things. But Councillor Tooman's right, um, at the end of the day, you know, the council being a major facility pro provider does have the ability to help that process of amalgamation and, and f future sustainability of organisations or codes um, into the future, um, you know, and that always doesn't come with syrup, it comes with a bit of taste sometimes. So so you're right. So we're well aware of that, but I think it's about trying to work with groups and move them through that process. Yeah. I guess yep. following that, uh, unlike the um, cricket ground and stadium, the ratepayers didn't put money into the hard things on the over here at the Bowls Club. They did all of that and create the greens or did we put money into it? I don't, I'm certainly not aware of that but maybe historically there was some but I mean um, I, I just 
Oh, we, they are, they're, they're leasing just land off us, is it, or are they leasing? No, no in we the, own buildings. In, in the, we own the buildings. Yeah. There. Okay. Yeah. So okay, then I take Councillor Tuman's point on that. Yeah. Yeah. Would it, would your attitude be different, more relaxed, if they were if it was just land, and they had put up all the buildings, which is the case for quite a few community occupancy areas? A sorry, a relaxed in what sense? Well, you, you're you're trying to push them with some justification uh, yeah. towards amalgamation, more efficient use of the facility. Um, well, obviously, it's you know if it's being funded by the ratepayer, and um, the answer would be um, yes to your question. But if it's funded by the ratepayer, that's why we'd like to help groups to hub and get the best use of those facilities as possible. So it's the best bang for buck for the public buck. That's what we'd be looking at going forward. Uh, but, but also I think we've got to look at it from uh, you know, the sporting side of things is that you know, um, we, you know, we all want sport, we all want people to be healthy and active and uh, in a whole bunch of different ways. So how we can do that but make sure that it, it's in a cost effective way. I think, yeah. I think that's where so council that, can play So we on. wouldn't, if we follow that philosophy, again, help um, Marist Rugby Club go to a new club rooms over there or Fraser go to new club rooms over, over here, um, um, a whole lot of areas like that where we've assisted rugby clubs not to base themselves around the stadium but to go off on their own thing in the last 10 years. Well, I think the key thing now is, you know, like councils over the years have made a whole bunch of different decisions for a bu bunch of reasons. I think now the advice we're getting is that we can hub um, the use of expensive facilities, then that's, be, that's that's the best for everyone going forward, and that's the advice obviously coming from Sport New Zealand and Sport Waikato. So, so we're trying to work within that mantra, but knowing that there's you know there's particular nuances to, in, to these situations, and we're dealing with a whole bunch of human beings too. Yeah. Deputy Mayor Testament. Yeah, just a question to uh, Lance or Sally. Does RDA qualify for any of the community grants? Does it, does it qualify and does it apply and does it get grants? I'm not aware of them applying, but I'd, I'd have to check that, Councillor Chesterman. They have applied when I used to be on the uh, little small grants committee, whatever you call it, uh, this mm. is well in the past. I've mm. no idea what happens now mm. and, and been successful. Yeah. Yeah. So, so part of the, the guidelines and the criteria is that we, we weigh that up as well. All right, well, we're ready, I think, to go. Uh, Councillor King, you have a question? Um, <coughs> so, as finance staff have, review, have you reviewed RDA's accounts, which finance staff? Who specifically? He's gone, Eric. Eric Thompson. Our group, we have accountants assigned to each group, so Eric works with us on a daily basis. So, Could we ask questions of Eric and Confidential when we go into Pink and put this off to later. What's the point? Uh, I'd like to know how much, what their bank balance is, how much money they've got in reserves, and I'd like to know how much money they've got in trust. And I don't think that's um, a question that should be asked in public, but I think it's very relevant to how we vote on this report. Yeah, I guess if they're a charity, they will have their, their financial accounts will be, um, will be publicly available. So can we ask that question in public then, if you're comfortable well, we can, with that? We can do. Um, I'm just not. I'm, yeah, I'm just not sure. I mean, if the accounts have been reviewed and a recommendation has come from the review of those it's accounts, um, do we really it's need to re-review them again? Can you ask another question then from those accounts? Or can a finance person ask answer that? And at the moment, the cost of 222 riders is $18 a year for the lease. And what we're looking at putting it up to is $36 a year for, for the council lease. And my concern is, is that that's a new policy which we've never, at this stage, it's a clean policy where everybody's paying the same across the board, which took years to put into place. Um, 
and I just think it's relevant to, to know exactly what their financial buffer mm. is. <coughs> okay. Um, they've got... Okay. Their assets are the buildings. No, not their assets, the yep. cash in hand yep. or the cash in trust. Um, they've got... Sorry, I've got my glasses on. Um, can, can, I, can I suggest, in the interest of time, um, the, um, count, the council has a second, uh, full council has to approve yeah. this, this lease subsequent to this meeting, so if there, there may well be an opportunity for this information that you're seeking, Councillor King, to be made available, um, so that um, if, if there is anything that in there that is, that is uh, important or... Can, or, or significantly changes the reasons for whatever we might decide on today, there's an opportunity to re-review that? I don't think I've asked an unreasonable question. No. We have a final... No, 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 I'm not saying it's an unreasonable question. But we're, but we're going to vote on this now, and it's the first step. Yep. Um, surely Paul's here. He can read this very quickly. Uh, he, he's an expert in the field. Yeah. How old are the financial accounts? They're, they're likely to be at least 12 months old, aren't they? Uh, the year ending 31st of December 2014. Okay. okay. So specifically, uh, Councillor King, the questions that you asked? The cash in hand, either in trust or in, um, you know, available to them. What What is their bank balance? What is What, what cash have they had? The what reserves do they have? The accounts that have been supplied for the um, review indicate that they had about $34,000 in the bank. Um, and they have equity of $190,000. That's in buildings or well, that, that's cash. Well, the majority of that is tied up into the, into the building, so, so they have no reserves as such um, indicated in, in their accounts. <coughs> no separate reserves apart no from separate, accumulated fund? Other, other than the retained earnings that the members have built up over time, or the group has built up over time, of $190,000, there is no other reserves. So there's no cash in hand? There, as I said, there is cash in hand of about $34,000. What's their um, creditors pool? Uh, they have uh, total liabilities, current liabilities of $12,000, which is um, uh, described as accounts payable, GST payable. So minus cash is about 20000 is it? That's right. And what's their annual budget in that year? It's about the operating budget? It's about 100 grand. 100 grand, yeah. so 20%. So they have have total income of about seventy eight thousand and total expenses of eighty three thousand. So they're running at a loss. That's, that's right. Thank you. So um, at at the rate that's indicated there, um, with um, they would actually use those reserves up between their uh, creditors, and if they ran a similar loss again next year. Thank you. Right. Um, so we're ready now to uh, consider the recommendations from management, and I suggest, uh, uh, given uh, the yeah, yeah no, I realise that. Um, I, given given what we've done in the past with these, and and also Councillor Gallagher having foreshadowed an amendment, we'll consider each of these separately. Okay. So I would like to, first of all to put um, items A and B, and B. Uh, this is in paragraph three relates specifically to Hamilton City Bowling Club Incorporated. Uh, so I would like to move the motion that uh, of, of uh, points A and B. Do I have a seconder for that? Thank you, Your Worship. Any discussion on um, the, the motion of A and B? Oh, right, those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Okay, so items A and B are carried. The second part of the um, recommendation is item C. And, um, and uh, are you able to put item C up? Can we have Councillor um, Gallagher's amendment? That's not actually a foreshadowed one, that that's the resolution, just an amendment. Are you going... Are you... Well, I'm happy to move a resolution that is exactly as you have there, and that is my, sorry, my motion, if I can get a seconder for it, and then obviously, no doubt, there may or may not be um, amendments. If it's struck down, then presumably someone else would move another motion. I'll second it for Councillor 
Isn't there? Is your amendment on the table, Mr. Chair? Is that your motion? Sorry. Uh, well, I was just going going to put it on the sorry. on the table. Yeah, so, um, I'm trying so, to so, so my table. suggestion is I'll put my motion on the table, and then we'll yeah. look at it. If you if you want to take, move so the motion, so I would I would like chair. to so, I would like to so move item C as is written in the recommendation. Right. And I'll look for a seconder, please, Councillor Mallet. So my understanding is that will be the, the that motion. That will become the motion. A, yep. That's the mo that's the original motion. S then I've moved an amendment. Which I'll Correct. Correct. Thank you. Which, which is exactly the same wording, but replacing the word 2,187 yep. plus GST. Yep. But you have a seconder. Yes. Second. Thank you, oh. Councillor Lawson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could we go back to Councillor Gallagher's motion? It's <laughs> moving it. a bit quickly. The screen for me. <laughs> that's it. Which was? Can we have them both up? They're identical except for the va the value. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So, Councillor Gallagher, you wish to talk? Speak to you. Your, yeah, I'll, um, I'll speak to the amendment, and I think. Um, Approving, in fact, uh, I, I want to compliment uh, Councillor King uh, for his um, doing some further analysis. And, and actually, as it turned out, that was actually uh, very, very helpful, actually. Um, but obviously, uh, on page 144, alignment to disability policy, approving the rent reduction would be consistent with Council's disability policy, which supports people with disabilities having equity and access, enabling them to participate fully in the life uh, of Hamilton City. Then we go to benchmarking. Staff compared the proposed rental with the financial arrangements for other RDA groups utilising council land elsewhere in New Zealand. The proposed rental is significantly greater than RDA groups elsewhere, with a range from nil to $1,500 uh, per uh, annum. Uh, no, number one, let me uh, compliment uh, staff on the quality uh, of this report. And let me also compliment staff on the work they are doing with a number of, 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 of groups. Whether or not I agree around quantum, uh, I've been very reassured around the process uh, that has been undertaken. So I want to have that very much on record. Um, we, we had um, a situation, I think, with St John's Ambulance. And of course, uh, that was uh, lost. Uh, but I think this is another example where this council uh, can make a statement uh, to an organisation and help them a little bit more for the incredible work uh, they are doing uh, to help a number of uh, people and a number of families um, in this city. And I notice that they, this organisation only has uh, one month's notice uh, and it means that they, they don't have absolute security, albeit I'm sure our staff would be wanting to have much longer conversations in one month. I'm pretty confident of that. But uh, we have good examples in this city where this city has been very, very, very generous to other sporting organisations. And the generosity reminds me of the lights that beam in from Seddon Park and the lights that beam in from the Waikato Stadium. Uh, I think an extra couple of grand to help this worthy group out uh, with regard to rental subsidy is probably quite insignificant in terms of our generosity uh, with regard to some of the other organisations that we have shown. Um, Having said that, let me record my praise for staff in at least listening to the RDA and at least having a status quo. I just believe we can do a little bit better. Thank you, Councillor Gallagher. Uh, Councillor McPherson. I agree with the points Councillor Gallagher has made, all of them. Uh, and I'm glad that he counterposed the uh, um, quantum we're talking about here against the um, quantums that were given some professional sports, several hundred thousand dollars to the, towards the um, Seddon Park slash uh, Cricket World Cup in terms of promotion facilities um, so that everyone can have a better view of Zimbabwe versus out of Mongolia. Um, and yet we are quibbling about this sort of amount here. 
less than $2,000. Um, Councillor King raised a good point, and I think perhaps when we have these applications in future, that sort of basic information <coughs> he talked about would be very useful to actually be in the report. Um, what it shows is that the cash they have in hand would allow them to survive if they got no income for a maximum of three months at their current rate of operations, and by the end of the year for about half that, and given the spending rate that uh, Paul outlined when he went through that. So um, this is not a wealthy organisation, uh, and I, Martin said all the stuff about the good work it does. It's not a wealthy organisation. It doesn't have significant funds to underpin it. Uh, what we do or don't do here is probably, in the scheme of things, going to be somewhat of a token. But I think if, any, if we were going to be making a token to um, support for any community group in Hamilton, this would be one of the very top of the priority list. Um, we, yes, we spent a long time working out the policy for community, uh, these community uh, lease uh, occupancy policy leases, but uh, we included in that and this has been said before, we included in that the ability for uh, rebates slash discounts like this to be given should a case be put up. This is, we're not going outside the policy, this is within the policy. And the only difference probably between this and the Red uh, St John's Ambulance case, as was pointed out at that time, that St John's Ambulance, St. John's Ambulance did not uh, ask for the discount, whereas this group has asked for it. Thank you, Councillor McPherson. Any other? Uh, Could I just uh, please be reminded of the loss that Paul read out from the financials? The loss that's indicated in our account is about eleven thousand dollars in the last year. Sorry, how much? Eleven thousand dollars. Can I just ask Paul? Is that have you got two years' results there? You don't have a comparative. Uh, yes, we do have a comparative. It was eight eight thousand dollars the year before. Loss also. Yep. So, so it's not just a one-off type thing. Yet. Thank you. That's great. Right. Any further? Any further speakers? All right. We'll take the amendment. We'll vote first on the amendment um, that the um, adopts the rent of two one eight seven plus GST. And I'll do that by a show of hands. Those in favour of the amendment. Uh, so those in favour of the rent being set at 2187 plus GST, please raise their hands. Chesterman, Gallagher, McPherson, Tooman, Green, Wilson. That's six votes for the amendment, Mr okay, Chair. And those, those against? Five against, Mr Chair. So the, the amendment has, has won. Amendment. And that motion. now becomes the motion. Yeah. So we have to vote on that. Yep. We vote on that. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. okay so the, the the motion now is uh, the the substantive motion is now the amendment or was the amendment. Um, so the, those in favour of the uh, two one eight seven, please raise their hands. Those. Are Two, four, six, seven votes for the motion. And those against? Four votes against. Thank you. Harry. All right. Uh, just looking at the clock, it's probably a, a good opportunity to have a recess for afternoon tea. So can I suggest that we resume at five to four uh, on the dot, please? <laughs> Still got quite a bit to get through. In terms of constructing the new reservoir, we've um, tried to summarise, um, where well, we have summarised in the report, um, but certainly sec security of city supply, and particularly in the northeast of the city, um, for the existing residents. Um, they give us the capacity to meet our growth, growth demands of the city, once again, particularly in the northern <laughs> sector of the city. Um, and the way we're building this um, reservoir will help reduce the workload on our uh, existing water treatment plant. Um, by providing the storage. So the optimal timing of the reservoir was uh, deferred as part of the last 10-year plan. So any further deferral um, will start to put us at risk. Um, so we're happy to answer any questions on the paper in front of you. 
Thank you. I've got uh, first question from Councillor King and then Councillor Gallagher. Yeah, when you're ready, I'll, I'll move the staff recommendation, oh, okay. A, ABC. And Thank you, Councillor King. You've got a question, Councillor Gallagher? Just in terms of uh, process looking ahead, um, should Council go down the um, CCO or Auckland water care model, where would this, where would this kind of stuff sit? You know, because obviously there'd be a sort of a bit of a two-stage process, I assume. This um, would absolutely sit in any model, any governance model for water. This is about um, technically providing water for um, for the city. So it wouldn't change, in my view, um, if the governance structure for water changed. So the CCO would initially get would get this report, a report like this. Look, I'd only be speculating how a CCO might work, but I think the business case model that this council's developed is based on the better business case, so one would expect if they had good practice the, um, that the, they'd be receiving the, the, the same this, sort of business this, case. So what you're saying is this would come from this room across to the separate offices of the CCO or Auckland Water Care company? Yeah, pro probably starting to stray offline a little bit in no, terms but, of but I'm this just report. Saying, Look, I mean, I'd be speculating just, how it's, that... It's kind of pertinent, because we're about mm. to make a major decision, mm. right? You know, a, a advancing a decision. <laughs> and I think this is a really good tangible example. I just want to get confirmation. Mm. A CCO would basically be dealing with this kind of stuff. If, if the, uh, there was an asset-owning CCO, they would probably be largely mm. making these decisions as a CCO. Would they do that like this, where we have open uh, and the media are present and in a public I'm meeting? Just not, I'm just not. I'm, I, th I think there's a lot of speculation going on here. Well, something that isn't really relevant to the, I, I th to the I report think that we're discussing. Council discussing Gallagher. the po point of order. Um, it is relevant in terms of a decision-making process. At the moment, we're making this an open decision, open session, right? What I'm trying to tease out, because obviously it could very well be that as the business case is advanced, this actually will land up with the CCO and potentially, as I understand it, apart from a couple of public meetings a year, this will be then closed door. And I think it's in terms of, so we're starting a process, Mr Chair, that could eventually, it's now doors open, but uh, along the way it could go into a room where the doors are closed. There's a lot of guesswork. I, I mean, I, if we had a CCO, we, there would be some memorandum of understanding with the CCO, there would be a statement of intent that we would get from the CCO, as we do from existing CCOs, who would then set to carry out what Council's requirements were. So there would be some degree of, um, uh, perhaps less than we have at the moment, but there would be some degree of transparency in terms of the CCO carrying out what the city's needs were. Less transparency than at but, present. But, but we less transparency. There would less be transparency, transparency well, than at present. Well, uh, who knows? So, so sorry, but, Chair, if I, if I may. Um, good points raised, but it's not relevant to this discussion. Transparency otherwise of different uh, water models, I mean, that, that'll be subject to, I'm sure, to lengthy discussion should that um, report um, suggest Head us that. in that direction. So, so can we focus on what I understand to be a $19 million spend uh, on, you know, th this is a significant project, yep. $19 million. Uh, could, I, could I suggest that we focus on the report? Thank you. Um, the point of, uh, I accept that. I assure you I'm very focused on this report. Thank you, Councillor Gallagher. Do we have any other uh, questions? All right, well, we have uh, Councillor King, who has indicated that he wishes to move the recommendation from management. Do I have a seconder for that? That's the recommendation in eight. The recommendation under eight, A, B, C, A, B, and C? Yep, I'll second it. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Chesterman. Is there any discussion on the motion? Um, just a clarification, I mean, the key one around, in terms of our LTP, what you're saying there is budget allocated in the 2012-22 LTP. So, you know, notwithstanding the, the alternative views that are coming through at our LTP process, this project was captured under the previous LTP. Correct. 
Yeah, right. Thank you. Um, could I just ask whether the mover and seconder would also agree to include that the um, this project goes on the project monitoring reporting yes. uh, list? Yep. Thanks. I think that's smart. Are you happy with that? Happy with that, Gordon? I've just add a D in that says. So add D in that it, that the, that the project uh, be included on the pro on the key po projects report. Thank you. Right, so I have a motion on the floor. Those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against, carried. Thank you. Okay. Item number 12, um, so you may as well stay there, Chris, yeah. is the uh, water extraction, um, uh, uh, the, the water extraction structure for the Waikato River. Take the report as read. Hmm. So if I could just say, take the report as read, but um, I think this is a, a, a risk issue and a risk decision for the city. Like the current situation without mitigation presents an extreme risk. I think that extreme risk comes from the increasing frequency um, of this event. Um, um, just for councillor's information, our predictions are that uh, we could get to the same point um, this um, summer season as well. So we monitor the situation very carefully, but current predictions are um, um, that the, the liver, river will be um, getting to a critical point. Um, we've got an existing contingency plan in place, as councillors know, which reduces that uh, risk, uh, but we believe as staff it's not suitable for this in, um, increasing frequency event. So we want a solution that will meet the demands of a growing city with an acceptable risk profile. Um, as the city grows, we will need to undertake significant civil works um, in time to in the river to draw the right water. Um, the proposal in front of you today is looking and recommending an option that will meet the growth demands of the city for 15 years and one that um, reduces significantly our reliance on third parties to manage that uh, risk. Um, the business case in front of you also uh, recommends as well as option two that we do some work on option three and that's included in our 30 year infrastructure plan so we're happy to answer any questions. Just one correction on paragraph 33. Um, the chair's pointed out to me. Um, it's got option three. It should be option one. So I apologise for that typo. Paragraph 33 should be option one, which will be provided. Happy to answer any questions. OK, thanks. Any que uh, questions? Councillor Gallagher. Yeah, two things. This, this would be a CCO one as well, wouldn't it? In future or not? It would be the challenge of the, um, the, the, the whatever administration's in place at the time to manage the city's water supply. So, so there's another one that may not be held in public. Just the other thing, just in terms of the, the, the current delegation, and, and I assume uh, Chief Executive, um, that this is obviously, this, this is what we make the decision here. Is, is that right in terms of the current delegation? That's my understanding, Councillor, that you've got a delegation as a committee to um, approve projects. Right. That's um, in the statement on the inside front cover. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Can I just qualify that? So um, um, a, a pro we deliver projects through contracts. So there's a whole series of delegations that come through yeah. contracting. Um, right. So on a project like this, some of the contracts will be within the CEO's delegation. Um, if they exceed the CEO's delegation, we'll be bringing them um, forward to council, and particularly in the previous report where there's some large civil works, they'll clearly exceed the CEO's delegation, we'll bring those to council. Uh, but council is really signing off on the, on the project today and the expected outcomes, mm. which gives us mm. a good benchmark to come back um, and report to council of, of of how we've achieved the outcomes of the project. Yes, so, so uh, through the chair, obviously there's still, obviously ongoing, in the current model, ongoing public scrutiny, but also you may have to come back financially, I mean. Um, uh, on this one here, it, it could be likely that we don't have to come back right. for any contract approvals, because it'll be a series of yeah. contracts that are probably within the CEO's yeah. delegation. The previous one will be different because of the large civil nature and they will be clearly big contracts that will come back and get um, fin council approval. Fi final question. Uh, Mr General Manager, are you confident 
for the previous report and this report that your staff, in terms of the reports and very comprehensive business case, uh, that you have sufficient expertise to, to recommend this to this board? Um, yes. So we, we have a, a model that um, allows us to have very good quality staff but access also to experts in the industry. And I can assure you on significant issues uh, we are getting the appropriate expertise and do the appropriate work to make the recommendations we put to Council. So that's in spite of any future CCO model? I mean, what I'm seeming in the, the last report and this report, it seems pretty high quality stuff in terms of, you know, coming up to gov governance level. Yep, we do a good job, councillor. Um, we've got good staff and our model that council allows us to operate with is to access the right technical expertise to make recommendations like this to council. Thank you. Councillor King. Yeah, Chris, just help me here a bit. Um, we were, we're voting to start we a bigger project long term, but short term, at the moment we have contractors who crudely put a raft in the river on when we think we're at risk and tie it up and get it all ready to go. And, and then what we're looking at doing here is buying our own raft. Correct. So at, at the moment um, we have a um, a heavy reliance on third parties and it's it's more than just a barge, the pumps, these are very specialist pumps and getting hold of those, um, look, uh, we may um, have to fly them in from overseas, some of the pumps that we're getting, so this proposal is reducing the reliance on those uncertainties in terms of having uh, the equipment here um, ready to deploy um, and just reduce our risk down to what we think is an acceptable risk. So Can I, can I just be clear, the Long-term proposal option three is clearly in the 30-year yep. infrastructure plan and that would come through a whole new process with Council, obviously. So what's it cost us for the last three years? I think we've had this draft in place. What's it cost yep. us per year for that? Yeah. And we have a, a whole series of Sorry, triggers. Page 212. Hmm. So we have a whole series of triggers at the moment that we start... Um, we're monitoring the river with our um, partners in regional council, the Mighty River Power. So we have a whole set of triggers that um, start certain actions. Um, they're designed to optimise our costs and the, the process is going through to trigger point one, right, where is the barge, where are the pumps? Uh, trigger point two is sort of then putting, reserving the pumps and the barges at um, no or minimal cost, but we then get to a trigger point where we've got to deploy um, the barges and secure the pumps and two times, yeah, but what, what two to three times we've actually got to the point where the barge is tethered, the pumps are on, they're ready to go. That's four times, but we've never had to de deploy because the weather has changed um, and the river levels have started rising. So, sorry, what, what's it costing? Um, I it think it's um, if full of deployed is 300,000, sorry. 325,000. Yeah, something around it, but that. Yep. So, so for us to buy the whole setup and run it, what, what's that going to cost us? Um, the the project is uh, two point um, three. Three point two four zero. Yeah, two point three four zero is the the project cost. Um, but but it, it's more than um, uh, just the equipment. So the equipment is part of it. It's quite a, um, a complicated arrangement. The power supplies. Um, to the equipment and, and this project is looking 15 years out ahead as well in terms of managing the demand for water that we predict in 15 years time so there's power issues and all sorts of other issues we, we would do to um, allow us to um, supply water. So you've said in previous meetings that the existing system you don't even know whether it would work if it was deployed? It's a contingency plan that we um, have confidence in, so we've never actually uh, deployed it in real time anger, if you like, if that's the right word, but we have had the opportunity um, through getting the barge there, getting the pumps there to test um, all of the pumps and test that it works, but it just never got to the point where the, the water's gone down and the hydrostatic forces of the river have gone and we're reliant on the water going in and staying in. 
So we're as confident as we can be, but we've just never had a real-time test on it. Right, so where I'm heading here is you were pretty shaky the last time you spoke on this as to whether it would work. You, you were, really weren't sure. You couldn't guarantee it. I guess we, we can't 100% guarantee it, but once again, um, I can assure you that we've had a lot of expertise put into the contingency plan um, to be to confident that it, that it would work. I think the current contingency plan um, will not provide um, the quantity of water that we'd need to keep the city going, so we'd have to come with some really severe um, water restrictions in terms of reducing our demand for the period of time we're deploying um, um, the, the plan. So by us owning our own gear, is that going to work? Um, at the moment, you're unsure if it's going to work. You're pretty sure, but you can't guarantee yep. it. So uh, if we buy our own gear, is it going to be any different? Uh, yep. So there's, as I say, there's a lot more to it than just the, the gear. There's um, uh, work to do to modify the intake structure to make sure that the water stays in the intake structure. So there's a whole raft of things to do. So Andrew, so from, from my perspective, this is this is a risk conversation. So we've had a, a plan which we've deployed four years in the past, and it's it's been fit for purpose as an emergency plan. Now uh, things have changed materially because we know we, we need to do some work on the impact structure, and we've signalled um, that there's going to be an infrastructure plan that says in future years we'll, we'll have to modify that structure. So the, the challenge is new now. It's, it's about having a plan appropriate for the coming 10 to 15 year window. And so an emergency plan we've got now doesn't meet that purpose. And so the proposal here would deliver something that would have all the normal redundancies that you'd expect to see on a piece of kit at the plant. Um, so it would have resilience in terms of, a, you know, if one pump failed, it would still continue to run. It would have all the full automation systems you'd expect to see as part of an extension of the plant. You know, all the alarms, all the fuel systems, all the backup energy systems. and So we don't have any of that with the current emergency plan, which has just been an emergency plan. It shifts it to an enhanced contingency plan, if you want, for a better description, um, that's fit for purpose to get us through the next period and the, the permanent intake structure. So it's a really, it's really uh, from my perspective, a risk management uh, conversation. And, this, uh, and then there's a financial, financial cost of managing that risk. Yeah, I understand that the risk is going to be lower from a point of view of getting services to the raft and it's a more permanent setup. What I'm asking is at previous meetings there's been doubt, there's been an element of doubt as to whether the you can suck water from that low up into the plant. And um, what I'm asking is, is the risk being lowered from that risk? Because that's a huge risk. It, um, it's a small risk, but it's a huge risk. Um, is, that, is that being changed by us spending $3 million? Absolutely. So there's parts of this plan that specifically address the, those risk items that you're referring to um, that currently exist in the emergency plan. Um, this plan also includes some improved concepts around testing as well. Um, so, um, so yes, yes is the answer. Yes, this this seeks to specifically target some of those very high risk items, uh, which is water coming back out of the intake structure inadvertently. So, so in a simple statement, the intake structure is uh, designed to suck water in. It's not designed to hold water in. So, some of the modifications that we'll do when the the level drops is modify the intake structure so it can hold the water in and supply the plant, just in a simple statement. I see on page 182, at the bottom, the last paragraph, um, is it, um, the proposed work will also source a solution for the wastewater treatment plant. Are, are you going to, can you use the raft at both places um, when it's not required at one? So the wastewater treatment plant also needs water for the treatment process and it's at a much lower quantity, it's about a million litres a day. Um, we won't uh, be using a raft. We have an emergency plan there which we deploy 
each time we've deployed one at the water treatment plant. So, um, so just to be clear, at the wastewater <coughs> treatment plant at the other end of town, we also take water out of the river to use in the treatment. So we've got the same issue there, the yes. level of the intake in the river at the site of the wastewater treatment plant. So this project will manage that risk as well, not with the barge, but with separate so things. It would be, it, so it's a, it's a, um, it would involve a pump system on the bank yeah. with, a, with, a, with an extended pipe arrangement to So no barge is envisaged at the wastewater treatment plant. Great. Thank you. Uh, Your Worship. Just interested in the budget. Um, so looking at page 187 and then on page 212, as I understand it, the estimated capital cost is 2.3. Yeah. Um, but the capital budget allowance right in the current budget is 3.2. On page 212, you sort of set out how it's going to be spent. So just reconcile those two for me, please. Because there's a contingency of 15% already allowed in the 2.3. So I am reading this right, aren't I, that now that you've had a chance to look at it more carefully and understand what the project <coughs> is, uh, the cost is, your estimate of the cost is 2.3. Um, but we have a SAP, PIF, SAP, yep. goodness, whatever, yeah. um, of 3.2 allowance. That, that's correct. So the budget mm, yeah. uh, that was allowed in the yeah. um, annual plan was three point mm. two four million. But we're going for two and we're doing now. it for less than that. And you would have seen on the risk <coughs> and opportunity schedule mm. um, the the balance there saying we don't need that. The yeah. the cost is two point three million, and it mm. does include three hundred thousand of contingency, just yeah. given the nature of this project. Got. Yep. Okay. That's good. So I think the recommendation does need to include the dollar amount because there's an adjustment on the PIF SAP allowance in the budget unlike the previous one where you've got to come back to the contract sign offs you know because it's a it's a multi contract yep. um, project so we're not 100 percent sure yet but this one we are so I'm happy to move the recommendation but I'd want to insert the 2.3 okay I've got some more questions so, um, so we'll I, was just going to signal the I was happy to Move oh, the recommendation, okay. but I will second the recommendations <coughs> okay. that the mayor uh, is proposing. Other other questions, yes. Councillor Council, Council, Council Um I presume this has all been cleared with Iwi and um, uh, Regional Council and the other river users. Yes. Would we run into problems with those? Or not? So we we abstract water yep. um, from the river under an existing <coughs> consent, and that consent and its conditions would continue to prevail under this arrangement, and we've tested that through Regional Council through a number of conversations, including um, each time we've deployed the current contingency plan in previous years. Okay. And probably a stupid question, what would a dam cost? Where, where you could generate your own power to drive everything and have <laughs> water at the same time. If, you, think, if you'd ever get it through. We I think Council term it was called Think Big. Yeah. And it was in the 1960s, <laughs> 70s. That was in Muldoon's Think Big. Uh, yeah. No, just Little Bang. <laughs> <laughs> you could walk um, across the front garden. And in which part of the city would we be flooding? <laughs> oh, no, no, just a little one. A que question from the Chair. Um, having the barge in place and being able to use the existing means of extracting water, does that give us a capacity to actually increase the speed at which we can fill up our reservoirs by using both both at the same time? Uh, you know, because I understand one of our issues at the moment is not um, necessarily a shortage of water, but it's the ability to get the water yeah. to get the water out of the river and into our reservoirs. It, it's probably um, this is just about delivering water to the plant. <laughs> the capacity of the plant's not changed at all. Okay. So, um, so we can't get the water in any faster and get it out to the reservoirs if the reservoirs are under pressure of water of of excess water being used. Oh, effectively, I'm saying, can we use both together? Uh, at the no, same? the capacity. This is about getting water into the plant for treatment. Yep. Um, effectively, the overall treatment capacity of the plant would be reduced because this is, you know, this is to lift less water in. Okay. Um, than the plant currently can on its own. 
All right, thank you. Okay, so we're ready to move, and I... I, I uh, I'm happy to move 11, um, with the, the business case attached to this report, um, with a capital expenditure sum of 2.340 million for a new structure. You can also add a D um, that... Um, I don't. I don't think the project, as it's implemented, needs to be on the project monitoring because it's a kind of an isolated project. But I do want to include a D that says that a um, a completion report will be provided to this committee when it's been completed. And I expect to see in that completion report, uh, in the better business case, which is the Treasury's model, it sets out you know what we're going to achieve by doing it. And okay, that's the part of that's in the testing, but I expect to see that that report covers those off. Right. Okay. You don't you're, need to write all that. That's you're happy with the changes, uh, Deputy Mayor, to the motion? Whatever the Mayor says. Whatever the Mayor says, okay. <laughs> Quickly, let me record that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have a motion, um, um, and the motion has been seconded. Um, is there any discussion on the motion? Those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Thank you. Okay, the last item on the public uh, uh, portion of the meeting is the wastewater treatment plant upgrade project, and this is a uh, close-out report. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, Chris Barton, our project manager for this project. Chris. Um, so this report is a close-out report to Council after a six-year program of works to upgrade the wastewater treatment plant. Um, called Pukiri 2. Um, we believe that it's been a, a very successful project and it's a, achieved the project objectives. Um, we have signalled a small cost overrun of the project of $117,000 over the $20 million. Um, we've signalled the risk of that cost overrun through successive reporting. I guess the background to that was the project uh, was rescoped in 2012 as part of the um, Ten-year plan at that time, where we deferred seven to eight million dollars of cost, um, largely for um, uh, due to finding an innovative way to not build a digester for some time, but also some of the contingency um, was reduced, and we signalled that risk. So, even with that small cost overrun, we think it's a, um, a highly successful um, project, um, and it delivered sort of on time, met its objectives and uh, good quality. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions? I have a comment when it's when you're taking comment. Okay, well, we'll do that once we've um, uh, moved the recommendation. <coughs> so no questions. I will move that the report be received. I have Second. a seconder. Thank you. Comment, Councillor Gallagher? Uh, yes, I... Um, just want to uh, compliment our professionals and the team uh, for this particular project and the work. And uh, forgive me, many years ago uh, there was a very visionary council that um, established and uh, did the wastewater treatment plant and became the envy of the country in the sense that they had long and forward vision. They didn't need to go to some local business people in town at the time for elected members from this community to have that vision. And I am very grateful as a citizen of Hamilton for their vision and I think in terms of the... You, you, you have come from an excellent base, in my view, in this area, uh, Mr Allen, but I just want to say that I think in terms of what I've sussed over this time, I think the way in which this uh, project has been brought through uh, within, within a reasonable sort of budget has, has been uh, excellent. And, and I have to say that, you know, it's one of these things, you always see the roads and you see the parks and the, the major facilities. The danger of this stuff is, of course, it's, it's hidden from view until it doesn't work. Uh, but certainly I think we are blessed with the uh, capacity and the professional capability that we have uh, in this part of the Three Waters project. So I just want to place on record my compliments of the team for bringing this project to fruition. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor. All right, we have um, a motion on the table that the report be received. Have a seconder for that. So those in favour, please say aye. Aye. 
Against? Carried. Thank you. So now we move to uh, public excluders. Excuse me, Mr Chairman. Yes. Um, staff, we're going to come back after afternoon tea about page 27F. Um, I, my, my understanding was that we had moved that as well as the query on overheads um, for staff to work on and report back to us. Um, that, that's correct. We're, we're uh, going to work on that. The initial um, request was to bring back some information after afternoon tea, but the request expanded to include some other reconciliations and summaries, so we were going to take that away and bring that back to a future Finance Committee meeting. Okay. Um, or, and <coughs> discuss with you and the uh, Deputy Chair at various meetings as well. Okay. So Are you happy for a future finance meeting, or would you like to see some information before? Well, uh, does it, I think it needs to go on the unfinished business then. Yeah, um, to ensure it doesn't slip on away. On the action list. I think yeah. it has been captured on the action list already, Councillor King. Um, Thank you. Is that right? Um, are, you, yes. are you happy, yep. are you happy yep. with that, yep. Councillor? Yep. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I'll move that we move uh, under Section 48 of the Local Government Act and Meetings Act for public exclusion to consider items C1 to C6, details of which are listed on page 232. Seven people here, Five, six, seven. We're at quorum now. Okay. Quorum plus one now. Quorum plus one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay